I remember learning early on on my first tour in HSL 37, you know, from my first chief I ever worked for, he's like, sir, you got three priorities. Your first priority, take care of your sailors. Your second priority, take care of your sailors. Your third priority, take care of your sailors. So that was my ingrained in me and my DNA as a young lieutenant in HSL 37, all the way now to captain of the ship. I never forgot those words. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I'm your host, Vincent Aiello, and joining me today in the Circle Air Group Studios here at Gillespie Field in San Diego, California, is a gentleman who began his military career as a helicopter pilot, but then transitioned to jets and later commanded an FA-18 squadron as well as a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Since retiring from the military as a Navy captain, he has continued to serve veterans, and today he is the latest guest on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Brett Crozier, Chopper, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah, you're that. You're welcome. I've been working on this one for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I didn't add to that intro just now is let's see, two time squadron mate, roommate, I think, yeah. on the O five cruise. On the O five cruise. Uh, nice. let's yeah. see, uh, officiating officer at my retirement. That's true. And guest speaker, uh, just, a, guest speaker uh, just well. a good friend, yeah. Well, you were the you like yeah, you were everything. Yeah. You were like the only other guy up <laughs> on the stage with me. <laughs> Cool. And then we talked about 20 years ago this month. Where were we? 20 years ago, five days ago, was yeah. our first mission over Iraq. Yeah. And it was right after the statue fell, and we were kind of the cleanup kids. Right. But, yeah. yeah. And that was my first combat flight in F-18 after a, after a transition, which we can talk about a little Absolutely. bit. But, yeah, it was, uh, I'm glad I got to fly that with you. Cool. Well, there's also something else that I think if listeners and viewers right now are like, Brett Crozier, why does that name sound familiar? We're going to get to that because for a while you were a bit of a media sensation. I don't know if I want to say darling, but yeah. you were... Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. so I think we're just going to pick this apart from the beginning. Uh, sometimes we just say, oh, give us your background before we get to the subject. I think your background is the subject. So let's yeah. start with where you're from and what got you interested in being a military aviator. Sure. And that's it's certainly a long story, but uh, I'll, I'll make it as concise as I can. But I, uh, I grew up in Northern California, Santa Rosa, actually. Okay. My dad graduated San Diego State, uh, did Air Force ROTC, and then went into the Air Force after that. Um, desperately wanted to fly, but he was colorblind. So despite his intent on memorizing all the colorblind charts, he couldn't pass. So he became a, a maintenance officer in the Air Force and okay. was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base. So my first real exposure to aviation was Nellis Air Force Base, um, you know, living on the base and then subsequent returns to there to see friends and family. And at one point, his friend was the CEO of the Thunderbirds, so we got to go back and check it out. So that probably planted the seed at mm -hmm. a really young age. Fast forward, we moved up to Northern California. There's not as much military up there. Um, I think I was probably about 16 when I, you know, really kind of I explored the idea of flying in the military, maybe because of that, the seed that was planted, maybe because I had this book I bought when I was six at the store in Vista where my, you know, my dad grew up and saved all my money. And it had like, it was the encyclopedia of military aircraft that I still have today. You know, the big ones that you fold out and have like the diagrams of F-18 was in there, but obviously the Tomcat and the F-4 were oh, prominent yeah. back then. And mm -hmm. uh, I still have it now. And, and so I I'd always looked at that over the years as a kid. So then in 1986, when I was 16, a movie came out that helped kind of focus my efforts a little bit on... Iron Eagle? Uh, it kind of, kind of was Iron Eagle, but, um, <laughs> but you know, it's the same year I'm learning to drive. I'm, yeah. I drove this, like, not very fast Ford, you know, four-door car that, you know, most of the time broke down. But when I saw Top Gun, I knew that um, there was a way to move faster and do something cooler than drive this this old Ford red car that I had. But uh, so I started looking at the academies, Air Force Academy, Naval Academy. And I had a friend that was at the Naval, went to the Naval Academy. He was a year ahead of me. And he said, you know, you should look at the Naval Academy. It's got more options than just flying if you don't want to fly. And uh, the Navy has some good opportunities. So I pursued that, went to the Naval Academy. Um, from there, knew I wanted to be an aviator. I mean, I, I would have skipped college, to be fair, to go right to flight sure. school if I could. Yeah. Um, apparently, that's not what they <laughs> was in store for me. So I went, went to the Naval Academy first and then ended up in Pensacola for flight school. Um, and from there, selected helicopters. Hold on. i got to interrupt you because yeah. your dad was Air Force. Did yeah. That, did that not ever play into your thoughts? No. I, you know, I, I mean, it did initially, and that's kind of why I looked at the Air Force Academy. And I think it was a combination of Top Gun, 
a okay. friend that went to the Naval Academy, and okay. that was kind of the influence where I, you know, I, I actually didn't know. I said I didn't know what you did in the Air Force if you didn't fly. Nothing against people in the Air Force that don't fly. Sure, Just, sure. At 16, I didn't know. Um, okay. I knew in the Navy you could fly, you could join the Marines, you could submarines and ships and SEALs and plenty of opportunities. Okay. So I th- felt there was more op- you know, more options that yeah. direction. So. Okay. I don't, I'm not going to try to make a habit of interrupting you. But, no, no, please. Uh, so when you were in flight school, right, we all go to primary mm-hmm. first, probably T-34s because we were about the same age. Yeah. Um, was the goal, like, what did your dream sheet say at the end of primary? No, great question. So I, um, like most, it was jets first. Okay. Uh, and, then, and then I put helicopters second, which maybe <laughs> most of the time we're probably putting jets, P-3s, and then helicopters. But for me, it was uh, jets and then a solid helicopter second. Okay. Um, and so then selected helicopters out of there. And I, and I'd done well in flight school, obviously not top of my class. I didn't get my first choice, but I remember being a midshipman at the Naval Academy and we went down to Pensacola and you get this exposure to aviation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we did the dunker one day. We went and jumped in a T-34 one day and a helicopter the other day. So I remember the T-34 flight because it was hot and panhandle weather and I was sick and just couldn't wait for it to be over. And the next day I jumped in the helicopter and we were flying low over the trees of, uh, you know, near Milton, Florida. And, mm-hmm. and I loved it. And I didn't feel sick and it was exciting. So then on day, day four, I guess, they came back and said, all right, we have one more day of flying available. If you want to fly T-34s, go this direction. So anyone that wanted to fly jets in their mind went that direction. I was still queasy from the first T-34 <laughs> flight. So they said, anyone's going to fly helicopters again. Go this so I willingly got in line, right. flew helicopters a second time. So then fast forward a couple of years. Mm-hmm. When I selected helicopters, I was not disappointed in that. No. I mean, okay. I mean, still, still had wanted jets, would have been excited to get them. Mm-hmm. Um, but helicopters ended up being a good fit for me, and I was very excited to, to go that path, which took me from Pensacola then to uh, North Island in San Diego, where I learned to fly the SH-60B Seahawk, okay. and then out to Hawaii with HSL-37 All right. uh, Easy Riders, which is a pretty good first tour for a uh, naval Well, agent. and North Island's not a bad place to yeah, do Island's your training or live, yeah, as we know. Um, okay, so you, were, you weren't disappointed. No. Uh, no. Were you like resolved to though or resigned to like this is my career then or so you know you're doing a tour but yeah. what's going on there yeah so love the tour you know 60 bravos at the time we didn't deploy with the strike group we deployed on uh, small boys so destroyers and frigates and we deploy around the islands we'd go we'd go to the persian gulf all over the pacific um and it's small you know helicopter dead at the time was small two helicopters six pilots about 25 maintenance off maintenance type personnel so a really tight-knit group like a mm. sports team and and we you know on a small ship you can pull into things like pango pango and singapore and australia and sydney and places you couldn't go in an aircraft carrier and so when you pulled in it was just a tight fun group and we went all over the world we had two big deployments and then you know when you're back home you're flying on the islands you're checking out the surf you're you're enjoying the surf. You're hiking uh, on the, you know, around the island. So yeah. I, it was a great tour. I never really thought about doing anything different. To be honest, I saw myself at that point continue to fly helicopters until I got tired of flying in the Navy. Um, so yeah, okay. so I did a, did a complete tour there and, and loved it. Loved everything about it. And so just to, again to make the point, while an aircraft carrier has SH back then, 60s on board, it was a different kind of SH-60, as I understand, and that is part of the air wing. You were part of a destroyer. Uh, was it was it destroyers you were on or yeah so we were on a destroyer and a destroyer. frigate okay uh, so that's a small aircraft it yeah. might or a small ship it might be near the aircraft carrier right, right. it might be just out doing its own right. thing yeah so different than we do it now where you tend to have two types of helicopters on an aircraft carrier within the air wing and then they can support the destroyers the frigates and the strike group uh, we still do expeditionary which is what I basically did on my squadron tour okay. where we would deploy as a detachment I was on debt seven um, and we would deploy as a dead on that ship for an entire workup and deployment and come back that way and, and maybe you never see the carrier. I mean, we did have a chance to work off the Kitty Hawk that was out there at the time, okay. but, um, but you might do the entire deployment and never see an aircraft carrier. Um, at the time, I'll be honest, aircraft carriers were scary. Like, there's this big <laughs> ship with planes all around it where, you know, you were kind of king of the show uh, yeah. on a small boy like yeah. that and, and enjoyed everything about it. But did they make you play slow games? I guess I don't want to sit here and bash on our... No, I mean, you definitely are more ingrained in the wardroom okay. and, uh, and the day-to-day culture of a small ship. So the captain of the ship matters because he... He is the one responsible for when you fly, and he has a lot of authority because he's not part of the air wing. He doesn't report to a CAG or, in some cases, the Admiral. He might be totally independent. So uh, so that relationship was important. We had a great – I mean, Captain Phil Green, I think he went on to be a three-star Admiral. Oh, but nice. He had a great relationship with our our officer in charge, our OIC, Joe mm-hmm. Bachnick. And, uh, yes, we had a lot of fun, and we enjoyed that. But – but we did have to, like, come to the wardroom and put on our khakis. We couldn't wear a flight suit to the wardroom uh, unless you were, like, <laughs> just about to go fly. And so yeah. I remember there were some protocols that – I mean, I didn't know any different at the time. It 200 wasn't, plus years of tradition. I mean, come I on. Know, yeah. So, yeah. 
you know, and it, and it wasn't until I got to the carrier years later that I realized, you know, aviators tend to wear flight suits all the time if they can. Um, but that wasn't the case on the small boy. But uh, so we were more of a department of the ship, I guess. Okay. And we called it the air department, actually, oh, so, cool. yeah. to integrate. And, and my roommates were not other aviators like right. you. Yeah. They were had the opso, I think, of the ship. And so we got to see how the different lifestyles and who slept more and who didn't. And I generally won when I came to sleep. So, uh, <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was fun. It was a fun gotcha. tour. All right. So most normal junior officer tours are about three years. Is that how long you spent? Yeah, about two and a half years. Two and a half. In Hawaii. Okay. Yeah. I, I left a little bit early for a, a follow on job opportunity that my, that I think that my XO at the time wanted me to go, to go fill. So we left Hawaii and moved to Memphis, Tennessee, actually. Oh, okay. So I was thinking maybe this whole transition thing, let's get to you now was yeah. part like out of the JO tour, but it was later. No, it was later. So. Okay. Yeah, so the transition actually comes pretty late in my career um, for most people to transition. So I left, yes, yeah, so we left um, Hawaii with Connor. So I had one son in tow, uh, Sean, and subsequently born in Memphis. But I went to Millington, Tennessee, and I was the oh. first helicopter shore detailer for junior officers. Okay. So they set up the job and then offered me the opportunity, and my exo would come from there. So he, he recommended me. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I stepped into the Purse 43 shop, which is kind of the – you know, where all the aviation detailers and placement officers reside and kind of manage the HR stuff for naval aviation. Uh, and it was a great tour. I mean, it's Memphis is not Hawaii. Uh, you know, it was probably the biggest shock, one of the bigger shocks we had. But we liked it. We, you know, we're mm-hmm. big fans of barbecue now, and we like uh, that part of the country. Uh, and it was a great place to work. You're surrounded by amazing people that work hard, that all went on to be COs of, of you know, squadrons and ships yeah. and CAGs and admirals, and it's yeah. quite a quite a good group to work with so and and just you know nice nice folks and all aviators at heart so so we on this show receive a lot of inquiries from young people that say oh i want to be a military pilot but i really want to be a jet pilot what happens if i don't get it and my standard answer is you know whether it's fate or divine like you got to figure out what your journey in life it's not no one else's and and bloom where you're planted you know and and it sounds like you had a chance to do that but then i'm kind of interested how this came along because while it's a great story i would hope you could also tell us like how often does this happen that there is an opportunity for people to transition from one community to another because you went from rotary wing to jets so i want to hear about that but also the training but like why like was there a shortage because now here's a guy who's they have a sunk cost in and all this training and they're going to basically throw that away and send you back to training so you can see where i'm going with all this no no yeah it's a great question and i wasn't even really aware it was an opportunity until i got there um and that wasn't my focus when i was a detailer i was focused on giving people orders they wanted you know at that point going to shore duty so i would help folks going from a sea duty squadron to like an instructor tour or an aid tour or a rotc instructor tour Mm -hmm. um yeah but it's a total numbers game so it's based on a bunch of different factors but as the navy tries to level out future department heads and ceos of squadrons by community they look at the force structure and the strength so if you have one community that's very healthy that's overmanned as it were and you have another community that's undermanned and they're worried about making enough department heads to then make enough commanding officers down the road they might open up a transition opportunity. Hmm. It also exists for things like sundowns. When you sundown the S3 or different platforms and you want to give them an opportunity and you need a way and a process by which you can validate and vet where somebody is qualified or not to go into a particular community. So it's, yeah, it's needs of the Navy. Uh, it's your, your performance previously. You have to certainly be qualified to go to the platform you want to select. Mm-hmm. Um, timing matters in terms of your career. And then your own, and professionally it matters too that you have to have a strong enough record. Sure. Your first couple, you know, your first couple of years because you're about to go back to training, which will take you out of the cock, you know, out of the uh, competitive fit rep cycle, right? right. For, for a couple of years, which means that, you know, you're going to have to rest on your laurels of your first tour and not get your next fit rep. So maybe you're in 04, which is the case for mm-hmm. me when I got, you know, when you and I started together in VFA 97 many years later. Did you have anyone who maybe didn't get picked up who sort of was throwing spears at you? Like, oh, you're at the bureau, so of course you get it kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, probably. Was, was I just, that... I've, ignored, I've ignored them, but no, yeah. There's, <laughs> but well, what, 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 you know, I mean, it's valid. There, yeah, to it? there is. It's, but, and this is where it gets complicated because it, it matters based on your group, right? You'd like to think we have more flexibility, but in many cases, manpower is dictated by congressional law, which is dictated by time and service, time and rank. And, and then your year group of when your commission matters. So, yeah, there's some years where people wanted to put in for a transition and there was no opportunity. The very next year, the very next board, which in the board's held about twice a year, there might be ample opportunity for a different year group. And it's hard for people to understand that. Okay. And, and so, yeah, so I think certainly my job as a detailer gave me insight into how the process worked, um, gave me insight into the fact that, yeah, there's an opportunity here that actually works based on the strength of the HSL or the 60 Bravo community I was coming from, that year group. 
and then what other communities might be available that want to transition. And, and, and so I, I wouldn't have put in if I didn't know that it was going to work out. I mean, I didn't think the numbers would support it. Right. Now, whether I was selected was up to the board. I didn't yeah. have a part in that, but I knew the numbers worked out to support that. And that's generally the biggest hurdle that most people have to get over is, you know, come from a community that can afford to let you go, that's willing to let you go, and then go to a new community that's, uh, that's willing to have you <laughs> and, and understand and that then career timing, performance, all yeah. that stuff matters. And, and they go all the way back. They look at all your flight school grades again as part of the board process. They look at your fit reps. Uh, and then they look at your recommendations from your community. Cool. And, the, the and what year is this? Uh, I, yeah, so I think I was there in 98, 99, okay. I think. Yeah, that's when I, and I left, we left in 2000 to go to then continue with the uh, training, the jet training. Okay, so because when you first did your flight training, it's usually in threes. I don't know what it is these days, but primary, intermediate, advanced. Everyone goes to primary together, so you didn't have to go back to primary. Right. But whereas you and I, roughly in 94-ish, uh, you went, intermediate and then advanced helicopter i went intermediate and advanced jet so did you go back almost like a brand new student to intermediate yeah jet? so that you had two options right you could do intermediate back then in the t2 and then go to the t45 for advanced but back then we had the ts syllabus which is the combined intermediate advanced syllabus so i okay. went we left um you know millington memphis tennessee and drove down with now two kids in tow and mary to kingsville texas and went right into the the ts syllabus so the intermediate advanced so it's very heavy the syllabus is designed very heavy on instruments and you know, instrument flying kind of stuff initially, and then you get to the more advanced mm-hmm. phase of air to ground. You know, of course, you know, uh, BFM stuff. Did your Did you find your SH sixty Bravo experience just made you a better student compared to yeah. when you were before, or even the peers that you had? I'm sure you made friends with other students, but yeah, for a couple of different reasons. One, you have a fleet tour under your belt, so you know how to talk on the radio. Things that, mm-hmm. as a new student, I mean, I remember being a T thirty four. My first fam, and you're, you have to really think through quick in the mic to talk the first time. Uh, and in some ways, we still do that, right? But more yeah. so when you're a brand new student and you yeah. haven't uh, even soloed. So by the time you've been in the fleet for a couple of years, you're you're pretty comfortable talking on the radio things, so that you don't have to waste any bandwidth on that. You mm-hmm. know, um, so that part that part came pretty smoothly for me. Okay. Um, your discipline's much better. Like I'll be honest, when I went through flight school the first time, it was like, you know, you're looking at the watch and like, all right, I studied an hour. That's enough. Let's go to the beach. Um, fast forward with a fleet tour under your belt, knowing that, you know, the career implications are that I have to do well here. There's no, there is no plan B. You know, I found myself studying more diligently than I did initially through flight school and probably more diligently than anyone there. Like I'd go in in the morning, study, do my flight or sim, study a little bit more on the back end and then go home for the day. And, and so I kind of treated it more like a fleet tour in a business, I guess, but, yeah. but it was, but it was challenging. I mean, there's still hard parts about it that were totally foreign to me. Um, I remember my first, my first simulator and instrument simulator in the BIs, and you know you get you get in the simulator, they close the cockpit, um, and the instructor steps behind a curtain, and so then you're you're doing your stuff. And I remember, you know, in a helicopter you have two pilots, so generally one person's flying, the other person's talking and and talking you through the approach plates and stuff, mm-hmm. and talking you through the approach. Well, there's no one else helping you, so in the simulator it's you yourself, uh, you know, and no one else. And anyways, long story short, I muddle through it and. It's all done, and he opens the canopy, and I've got my charts like taped up to the canopy. I've got, you know, it's just a total yard sale. And he's like, uh-huh. you know, you got to figure out how to do this a little more effectively, um, because there's just so much you're trying to do. And I'm used at that point. I was used to having a yeah. co-pilot per se, and, and now sense. I had to figure it out. So, um, but I, but I, you know, I, I did. I figured it out. Um, challenges were so that came pretty quick. I think as you got more advanced phase, then conceptually things are moving faster. Uh, and then certainly when you go to the boat for the first time, uh, it was all different, right? No and, bad. Uh, I remember my first trap. Um, so, yeah. So, anyways, first trap, CVN 69, I believe, was. Um, Eisenhower. On the, yeah, on the Ike. And, uh, and so, we, I, in a helicopter, when you land on a destroyer or a frigate, you do not want to roll into the hangar. So, you generally land with your brakes set. So out of habit, when I landed on the carrier the very first time uh, for a full stop, even for a trap, so mm-hmm. the first couple are touch and go, and there's a reason they do it that way. The first time I landed on on the Ike, I slammed on the brakes, like, and I instantly bullseyed the tires, and smoke's coming up, and <laughs> and all I can think of is the video they showed us in training where a T45 had blown tires and went off the edge, yeah. and there was ejection. So in my mind, I'm thinking, this is me. I'm making this happen. And, but it was just total instinctual, and I got sidelined, and... <laughs> the LSO apparently had to talk to the captain and explain potentially why I had okay. made a pretty egregious error. So, so my first trap was a cut pass. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know we were in a club together. I yeah. have one, but it was as a fleet pilot. Yeah. Hold on, I jumped ahead though. Yeah, sorry. So you had a pretty good idea, like you said, when you were at Millington that your record would be or your application would be well received. Yeah. When you found out, was that exciting or was it like okay, yeah, I kind of expected or? 
No, it was exciting. Yeah, so they called yeah. my bluff a little bit, right? Like in my mind, you know, I had the conversation with Mary's, and and she always refers to the rocking chair test, right? Like, okay, you know, you're going to kill yourself if you don't apply. Like, mm. knowing the opportunity exists, the timing works on your favor. If you don't apply, you'll regret it. You know, you can't hurt to apply and be told no, but if you don't That's apply, right. you'll never know. And, and still, I did. Someday we're sitting on rocking chairs with a beer in hand, and are you going to have regrets? So you didn't try something. That's so right. I took her advice to heart, and yeah, so they called my bluff, and. um and I, you know, I knew I had a decent shot if the community stuff supported it. Right. Okay. Um, so I was excited. And, and, and you're assigned a platform. It's not like you get to go fly jets. Like I knew I was going to go fly F-18. And that's because what you said earlier, which yeah. is the SH-60 Bravo community was pretty fat, I guess. And the other was yeah. a little thin, at least in that year group. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So, uh, all right. So now catching back up. So did you end up DQing or did you, or just, no, no, I, no, I, I, okay. I, you, I, you recovered? Yeah, I okay. yeah, it was a strong, okay. strong comeback. But. Okay. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> all right. And then now this is where our paths cross because, well, maybe not yet. Right. So then you go to the FR. Yes, yeah, so we to left learn. Texas, went mm-hmm. to Lemoore, to okay. BFA 125, and and again now I'm a, I'm a Cat One, but winged like everybody else. Initially through advanced, I was the only winged student, um, so right. now I'm winged, and I'm also an 04 select pretty shortly after getting there. So I'm a pretty senior. <laughs> you're the you're the same rank as the instructors. Yeah, yeah as cat, and more senior to most of them actually. Oh, wow. so, okay. Um, yeah, so I was a senior, you know, Cat One student as it were, going through, yeah. and uh, yeah, so we got there in 2000. So that went all the way through. Uh, I remember going on. We were going on a strike flight on uh, to Fallon, my first live hop, when 9-11 happened. And I remember, you know, you know we all kind of remember where we were. Oh, yeah. I remember the base, you know, having a long, took a long time to get to base. But I had an early flight, and I remember uh, my instructor wanted to keep briefing. Because we didn't, at that point, we didn't quite sure. know what was going on. Sure. And, uh, and then we came out of the brief to where we were going. To <laughs> I was different. super excited to go to Fallon and yeah. drop live for the first time. and and realized we probably weren't going to fly anywhere that day. The world changed from when you went into the briefing room yeah. to when you came out. Okay. So how did that go? I mean, again, you had a little extra experience, and now you've got some single-seat jet time. Yeah. So, Yeah, good. I mean, there were things that were more challenging than the others. I mean, sure. instrument stuff was second nature. And you know what I mean? To be a good F-18 pilot, you have to be good at instrument flying because you're flying instruments a lot um, and you're managing systems a lot. Um, the strike stuff was pretty good. I think the air-to-air stuff was probably the most dynamic for me because obviously you don't really get to practice that in the same way in a T-45. Yeah. So, uh, And then back to the boat, which, again, remember all that. I mean, I obviously you've been to the boat daytime in the T-45, um, but then it was probably the night, te- you know, the night, F-18 stuff and the FRS that I, that I distinctly remember being quite a challenge. Were, were you questioning your decisions, perhaps? <laughs> uh, I was questioning my survival at times, I think. I don't know. that. Yeah. I think I had a night in the barrel, you know, a tough night out there. I got sent back to yeah. the beach, hung out in the hotel room or the queue, watched the Olympics. I think it was like the kickoff of the Olympics oh my gosh. or something. Okay. And I uh, have some distinct memory. And then yeah. trying to really decide if, like, oh, you know, I got to go back out there tomorrow and finish this. Uh, so, but it worked out. Everything works out. Okay. So just to draw parallels here, and if it sounds like I'm graduating myself up, uh, you know, just hold on. Everyone will listen. Uh, but while you're learning how to fly the F-18, I'm teaching PhD level tactics right up the road yeah. in Fallon where yeah. you're trying to go at Top Gun, yeah. right? And so then you essentially finish the FRS and you go to what could arguably be your nugget yeah. D- deployment, but as a, uh, 04. As an 04. Yeah. And I show up as a training officer. Right. So, uh, we actually mentioned you on episode 163. I don't, you probably okay. didn't catch it, but it was with know. Trots. And the question I had for him was the Strike Fighter Weapons and Tactics program. Okay. Was you showed up and now there's this method instead of just the CO of the squadron saying, Oh, it's Chopper. And, yeah. and that's a whole call sign thing we'll get to later. But, yeah. uh, you know, this guy, he's, a, he's good. You know, we'll just put him through this. Like, no, he needs to go through these things. And as I recall, we probably flew a few of those yeah. Uh, together. Yeah, we did some um, tapes together, I think. Oh, yeah. And then, as you said earlier, we we flew together yeah. in uh, April over Iraq. So, yeah. um, but what was so what was that like showing up at the squadron where you're sort of a nugget, but you're sort of almost a department head at that point? Right. Yeah, you're pretty senior. I mean, so yeah. I mean, I think one thing I learned going back to flight school was you know the importance of being humble in this community. Yeah. I mean, the only way you're going to learn is if you're eager to learn new things and you're not trying to rest on your laurels of what you did before. So. Mm-hmm. I'm a big believer that, you know, you know, someone smarter than me said, you know, learn like you're going to live forever. Um, and, and I, you know, I knew I had a great opportunity, so I was eager to learn. And I also knew the importance of it. I mean, I wasn't going to fly F-18 just so I had cool patches and, and hung out in ready rooms, but, but there's an important mission we had to do. So, and I had nothing to rest it on. All my, 
anti-submarine tactics and WSC stuff I did as a, you know, as a helicopter pilot um, were not going to be as transferable. Now, now stuff I learned about leadership and stuff I learned about being a division officer, mm-hmm. maintenance stuff is an HSL 37 I carried with me for the rest of my career. And that did help me. So when I got to VFA 97, you know, this, I, I didn't have to be the coffee mess officer, right? I didn't get some of the lower, the jobs you generally get right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think I was assistant QAO and then assistant operations officer. So I got jobs that were a little more relevant to my experience level, um, but also wouldn't distract me from all the stuff I had to learn. And I thought, uh, you know, the skippers at the time, both, uh, you know, I think it was Moby and then, uh, and then Flounder, right? With were, Dobes for a little bit in the and middle. And Dobes for a little bit in the middle. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But they were both very accommodating, which yeah. was great. I mean, they could have treated me like a brand, a brand new straight stick nugget, or they could have treated me like a senior, you know, a, a young Expect department a head. More. And I wasn't either. I was right in the middle. Yeah. Um, and so I respected them for that, and they gave me a lot of credit. Yeah. Well, and my first impression of you is here's a guy who has a different way of getting here, but he's here and let's train him up. And so, like I said, I was coming from Top Gun as proficient as I'd ever been and you were relatively new. (laughs) And so we flew some of those SFWT hops together and then they combat paired us for uh, um, Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, And then uh, what a year after that. We both end up in the same squadron right. again. Some of these patches behind me on my side, and now we're both department heads. So yeah. we're essentially yeah. equal. But you're still—I mean, everybody's always still learning. But yeah. did you feel like ready at that point? So, as I mean, I felt like I knew how to be a good department head. I knew how to lead and manage people. Um, but I still knew I had a lot to learn. Um, you know, as a, as as a pilot, as a you yeah. know, in the F eighteen community. Um, I mean, I think I got my level four, my division lead qual. Like right when I got to VFA 94. So the first time I ever led a division was a brand new department head in VFA 94. And my tour in VFA 97 was not that long. It was about two years. Um, so I'm brand new. I've led maybe one or two divisions. You come in behind me as a department and you've led, you know, dozens of flights like that at the time. So I still knew I had a lot to learn. And I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I guess I felt lucky I was surrounded by guys like you and others in the squadron that were very accommodating and, and understood my strengths, maybe as a department head, but the stuff I needed to work on. And then I tried never to shy away from it. You know, you, you know, it would be easy to try to shy away from the flights that might be challenging, uh, or things that might, you know, that you have to, you know, put yourself out there a little bit. I tried yeah. not to do that. You know, I wanted to learn as much as I could so that I felt comfortable, particularly when you lead junior pilots around, which yeah. is now, you know, now I'm leading junior pilots in combat on that cruise, right? Yeah. So by the end of uh, your department at tour, did you end up as a strike lead via the Fallon training? I did, yeah. So I got that. In fact, I got Good. that before that, that last deployment. That 05 deployment? Okay. Yeah, I did the strike lead syllabus. So at that point, I felt, I mean, that's probably as tactical as I've ever been mm-hmm. um, because, you know, it's a great syllabus. We have a great training program in the Navy, yeah. and I felt pretty well prepared. And then, uh, and then it, and maybe atrophy after that, but, no. well, but, but you know, you know, you, you go on deployment, you don't focus on all the same skills. You focus on the skills that matter for the mission at hand. And, yeah. and, uh, and I, but I did definitely felt well prepared for that. Good. So it was good. Well, and this is now why I was bumbling over that statement earlier about, uh, I, I didn't mean to project myself above you because now after this, you go somewhere which you can talk about. And ultimately the Navy chooses their command officers based more on leadership and a lot of other things, not just tactical prowess. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying it was only those two things, but you end up screening for a command. I yeah. didn't, and there could be other reasons for that. But yeah. um, so, where did you go after VFA ninety four? And, and what yeah, was so that I like? left. So the good news is, is I knew I needed more flight time, right? And the community knew, okay, hey, you've done well as a department head. Your timing worked out, as we talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, and but we want you to get more flight time, which I wasn't going to complain about. So I went across the street to VFA one twenty five as an instructor, where you were a student, at, where I was a student only yeah. a couple years prior. Now I was the operations officer for the squadron, which. Which again, I just left VFA 94 as an operations officer. Professionally, I had a pretty good handle on how to manage those kind of programs and mm-hmm. stuff. So I felt pretty comfortable. Uh, I had to learn how to now instruct air to air, air to ground, all that stuff. Um, but it was a great tour. I got to fly. Uh, anytime you can fly and, and I hadn't, didn't have to go to DC. I didn't have to do a joint. So I felt pretty lucky, uh, to get that. And, and the community supported it because it was a pretty important job and you have a lot of moving parts over there. Yeah. Uh, so I did that for only about a year, year and a half and then went to War College in Newport, Rhode Island after that. Okay. Because once you start getting higher and they look like you have a future, they'll say, oh, we need to send this guy over to do this. And yeah. War College is one. Uh, does that count as like joint as well? Or is that? Not? It does not. No, okay. No, yeah. So, but War College is like one check in the box. Joint is a check in the box. There's all these different things you can do. Yeah. yeah there's certain wickets that the Navy has to meet right. based on congressional rules and whatnot and laws. Yeah. So, so that meets that requirement. Professionally, we, you know, we decided as a community that, that we valued a master's um and and in your career progression and, and to get that it's easier to get that before you're a CEO than after so we try to front load that on somebody's career yeah. track and and my career you know I had a 
you know, other than HSL 37, my first tour, I hadn't been in one squadron, you know, up until I got to be a CO for more than about two years. I mean, just was, they're quick and, and that's the nature of some career paths. Right. Uh, and we were okay with that. And luckily my wife, you know, Mary was pretty supportive, even though you know, I think we did 20 moves in 30 years when it was all said or done. So, oh, gosh. well, and so the point being is, okay, we chose wisely with this guy, bringing him from that community to this. He's yeah. doing well. Let's get him these experiences. Yeah. And so ultimately, probably while you're at the war college, you get the phone call because they look at everyone's records and there's not a whole lot we have to do other than just maybe check them ourselves, make sure there's no gaps in this right. or that. And you get told, hey, congratulations. You're yeah. going to be a, a VFA, as we call those squadrons. Come yeah. So yeah, I found I was going to scream, which is great. It also, man, I hope that I didn't have to go then to my joint tour because normally you might have to go from your war college your master's program to some joint job in the Pentagon. So mm -hmm. I knew that there was a good chance because I screened my first look that I might be able to skip that and go right to, to be a CEO, uh, which is good. And, and we wanted to go back to Lemoore, which I knew that most people at that point didn't just based on where people were coming from. So I mm -hmm. knew we had a higher than not, even chance of going back there. So yes, yeah, so we left Newport and drove back to, uh, Lemoore, uh, moved back into the house we had left and then, <laughs> and then, uh, took over nice. command of VFA 94. Uh, okay. Which is great. Were you there when, so both 97 and 94 ended up doing, what do they call it? Unit deployment pro yeah, program, UDP, right? So, so Marine squadrons come on aircraft carriers as mm -hmm. part of the Navy Air Wing. And for a while there, I don't know if there was just shortage or a surplus of Navy, but a couple of Navy squadrons went and played Marine for right. lack of more succinct. Yeah. So it was, it was part of the TAC air integration program. Okay. To, one is for interoperability between the Navy and the Marines. And two is just because of the number of aircraft we have. And oftentimes our F-18s were limited by trap counts more than mm -hmm. they were by hours. So it's a, la a way for us to move aircraft around as part of the master plan so that, you know, we have squadrons that you know, Navy squadrons that don't, that have airplanes that don't have traps left on them. They might have hours, but no traps. And so we could, we could move stuff around and squadrons around and support that. But a lot of it was interoperability. Okay. Um, and, and good for the Marines to understand how carrier air wings work. And then good for Navy to understand how the Marines deploy. So yeah, yeah so I got to VFA 94. Uh, I'd left it and we were, a, a, you know, air wing squadron with, uh, with CAG 11. But just about to go in. And they the were, yeah, deployment. starting to look at mm -hmm. it. So then I came back to VFA 94 and I, you know, again, I'd only been, gone from the squadron about two years at that hmm. point, right? Between my stint as an instructor and then uh, war college. So there's still many people in the squadron that I knew as a department head, uh, to include some department heads. We're still, uh, we're oh. still there. So, and we were getting ready to go expeditionary. So now instead of deploying with an air wing, deploy with the Marine air wing. So, you know, a mag or a mag 12, as we call it. So a Marine air group and we deployed to Iwakuni, Japan. So a uh, little different. You don't deploy as one big unit. You know, the, the MAG stays there in Iwakuni. That's where their headquarters is. They're, instead of a, a Navy captain, you have a Marine colonel that runs it. Uh, and then we would transpack. We basically grab two tankers and take 12 jets and the entire squadron. And we hop, skip, and jump across the Pacific, you know, generally through, I think, went through Hawaii and Guam mm -hmm. or Hawaii mm -hmm. and, and uh, no, Hawaii and Wake is the oh, other right. option. Okay, yeah. And then you end up at Iwakuni. Um, and yeah, and then, and you're there for six to eight months and you call it home for deployment. The reality is you're there probably about half the time. The rest of the time you now deploy as a squadron to, God, we went to Korea, we went to Australia, we went to Philippines, um, you know, Singapore. We went back to Hawaii on the way back for a month. I mean, it's probably the best deal because you're not yeah. only, you know, especially for someone that has a lot of boat time and experience, you know, now you're deploying, you're flying F-18s, you're, you're not worried about saving gas to come back to the ship for a trap night or day. Um, so you can, you can fight to bingo, as we say, and then you come back to the field for a nice big long runway yeah. to land on. And then you can debrief at the club. So it was pretty, pretty good living. Uh, <laughs> Never mind saving the gas chopper. You didn't actually land on the boat after that, especially at night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did not. Did not. <laughs> so did you make just that one deployment SEO or did you end up going back? Did to one as the XO? Um, and then one as a CO. So I did two, two deployments. Both UDP? Both UDP. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so you can you can ask me later, like how long from my last trap to my trap when I was then when, when I become the CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt, but it'd been a few years. Wow, I bet. Yeah. Okay, and did that play into not to skip around too much, but generally, squadron commanding officers who do well will have somewhere else they need to go, and you can tell us where that was. But then they start getting looked at for one of two tracks: one is the air wing commander, yeah. and the other is the aircraft carrier CEO. Right. Was, was any of that UDP or your SH-60 experience part of that discussion? Do you know? Did you ever talk uh, about it? I, maybe. I mean, a lot of it is – you have a lot more control you're, at that point, right? So in my mind, I mean, I'd been away from the boat just long enough to want to go back to the boat, I guess. And, and, and I knew that 
it would be more challenging I'm on paper at least to be selected for Airwing Commander because I didn't have a CO tour on you know as a, uh, in an Airwing. Um, I had plenty of time as a you know, department head and others on, on carrier, but I knew as a CAG, it, I mean I'd figure it out. I just knew that you know I would look better on paper maybe going a different different track. Um, and I also knew you know I want to try something different too. I mean I liked everything about being a squadron CO. It's, it's like they say it's one of the best tours you'll ever have. But I also knew that I had some other stuff I wanted to learn, and I wanted to know more about, you know, how to how to drive a big ship, you know, and learn about nuclear power. No, I wasn't I wasn't excited about the nuclear power part, but but it ended up being very insightful, and, and it's a it's understandable why you go through that path. But yeah. uh, but I knew I wanted a new challenge. So in the in the spirit of always trying to learn something new, I figured it was a new path. Okay. So I left VFA ninety four, went to then my joint tour because I had at that point, you know, you have to get yeah, yeah. joint before your captain. Uh, and then I, um, went and not with no intention of doing anything at that point. I just wanted to finish the tour, CO tour, which I loved. And then, uh, promised the family we'd do something cool. So we moved to Naples, Italy and I did a two year stint out there, yes. uh, with a NATO command of all things to get my joint credit, which is a pretty, pretty easy way to get joint. I mean, um, if you have to go to the Pentagon and, and do your joint time that way, it's a much harder, but we had our, you know, we had challenges and it's not never an easy move to take the whole family to Italy yeah. and, it's, you know, working at NATO, you know, the joke is NATO stands for not a, another Thursday off because you're trying to celebrate all the NATO nations. <laughs> but, uh, you know, despite all my, my second guessing when I got there, because it was things were moving pretty slow when, mm-hmm. when Arab Spring kicked off and everything started happening in North Africa, you know, from Tunisia to Egypt to then Libya, we were right there. So I got pulled right into that where I started doing mission planning, strike planning in Libya. Uh, first as a U.S. guy, so I sidelined my NATO job. Hmm. Was brought on the Mount Whitney and basically did strike planning. Uh, everything he did in Fallon, I took that with me on board the Mount Whitney, and that's what I did for you know a month at a time. And uh, it was it was pretty neat. I learned a lot. And then once the U.S. was done and stuff in Libya, Operation uh, Odyssey Dawn, we went to Operation Unified Protector, which was a NATO mission. So we handed over the reins to NATO, and now I put my NATO hat on and did that for another okay. seven eight months. So all the NATO guys and gals I worked with that I used to tease about too many coffee breaks. They were right there with me, and they stepped in, and, and uh, we were working long days, seven days a week. Yeah. Uh, still found time for espresso, but um, but they were they had my back. It was it was pretty. So you know the joke is you know it's hard to fight fight with your NATO allies, but it's much harder to fight without them. Mm-hmm. And that was very true with everything we were trying to do. And they all they all really stepped up. So I have I learned a lot about the importance of the alliance and getting stuff done over there. And isn't that the point of sending people on these joint quote unquote, yeah, right? Experiences yeah. is learning about our partners, whether it's air force and yeah. army and Marines or other countries, allies, right. et cetera. So, I mean, most, most conflicts in the future, we're going to fight with allies. We better. Yeah, right. And so it. understanding yeah. how we do that is important and how to, how to interact and everybody's strengths and weaknesses and how you communicate is yeah. important. Just describe real quick for me the Mount Whitney. Is like a command and control ship. So, yeah, and, and up down the road, I'll command the Blue Ridge, which is the same so, class right? of ship. Mm-hmm. Um, they were separated by like six months. But it's a basically, it's LCC. It's a large command ship um, designed as an amphib, and now it's a communication ship. So those two ships have more bandwidth than probably any other ship on the seas right now. And they, mm-hmm. can, they allow for command and control. They allow for the admiral and the big staff to come on board. You know, we had, I think, during that operation, we probably had a thousand staff officers underway, not including the ship's company, which is another 500. And we were doing strike planning and mission planning and you name it. And, and you've got a suite for the four star admiral, a couple three star admirals, a couple two stars. Wow. I mean, it's a big, you know, it's a big, uh, basically floating headquarters. Top heavy. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So let's get back to your progression, though. You're going to get told that you uh, are screened for command for – how does that go? Is it just, hey, we're going to move you in this direction, or ultimately we think we're going to make you an aircraft carrier CEO? Like, what's what's that announcement? Yeah, so, you know, normally you're going to be looked at for major command at some point based on your career timing and, and where you are. You know, I, I had enjoyed my NATO tour, and I was able to kind of see that – you know, there's an opportunity to apply essentially and put in for the new program to be looked at a year earlier than my normal s- selection would be for aircraft, for air wing commander, for okay. So I, you know, I just kind of did the math and I said, I have a unique CO tour because I did expeditionary with BFA 94. Let me see how this thing works out because I, you know, it's like I said, I was interested in, in learning about, you know, driving an aircraft carrier and I wanted to learn more about that. Uh, and I thought it was a great opportunity. So in, in my mind, that was the pinnacle and it forced me to apply early. Knowing that if it didn't work out, I could try again the next year, and I could also have been looked at for CAG the following year. But um, but as luck would have it, I was selected for for the mm-hmm. first look. For selection. So in which, yes. what you really are selected for is a nuclear power program and the track. And it doesn't guarantee you uh, command of an aircraft carrier. It guarantees you nuclear power school, uh, assuming you, you know, meet the wickets. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you go from there to be the ex-over aircraft carrier 
And then you go from there to be the CEO of a deep draft like the Mount Whitney or the Blue Ridge. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what you're selected for. You're selected for major command, which is then, in that case, a deep draft where you learn how to manage a big ship, as it were. And the so. idea is they're watching your progress and, you you know, some yeah. admirals evaluating you and they're like, hey, here's a guy. Who, yeah, it's, yes. And it's a tenure track. So you're committing for almost 10, 10 years. years. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and so the, the process of selection is one, is the candidate willing to do it? Mm-hmm. Uh, is his family going to support him? And there's mm-hmm. stories of in the past where the spouse had to submit a letter with the, with the person applying, which they don't, <laughs> I don't think they do anymore. We didn't do it, but, um, because they wanted to make sure that you understood it's a 10 year commitment. Yeah, yeah. And then they go back and I look at your grades in college, um, which really? remember was to that point for me was 20 plus years ago. And then, Assuming you make all those wickets and you're selected based on your performance and, you know, the timing and your academic performance, then you go and you sit down with the director of Naval Reactors. So they fly you to DC to Naval Reactors and you sit down with the admiral, the four star admiral, and, wow. and he asks you questions about like, why were your grades where they were in college? Uh, <laughs> what were your priorities? Yeah. Partying and or so studying? some of it, you know, you can write it off and say it's, well, sir, it was 20 years ago. It was a little bit different. And, and, and in most cases, that's probably a good answer, right? Um, what they want to see is, are you there willingly? Do you understand the challenge you're about to undertake? Yeah, yeah. Are you willing to, you know, you know, he's kind of reminding you, this is not an easy academic program. I mean, you're going to be basically a, at a master's level of engineering, nuclear engineering for the next two years. Are you ready for it? Um, and they, they can generally get this sense from how you respond okay. and how your record goes. So, um, yeah, but I, and I had a, uh, it was, for me, it was a good interview. I enjoyed it. He asked about my family. He, you know, he said, make sure your family remains your priority. I thought it was really good guidance from a four star right. at the time. Yeah. Um, and so we moved from there. From, so from Naples, Italy, we moved to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. And then you undergo essentially two years of nuclear power training. But pretty intense, right? Like pretty intense. Almost yeah. like nonstop finals. I think I yeah. heard. Yeah, you basically have. To, I had to be a much better student at that point than I ever was in college. <laughs> uh, and so I had to kind of ramp up my game, uh, which is kind of the story of my life. I keep having to get better because I keep <laughs> trying to challenge myself. And yeah. uh, and they were long. I mean, they were. You were in early. You stayed late. Um, the first six months or academic like a classroom environment and you're you're in a classroom with 22 year old college graduates they're fresh out of like engineering programs or or maybe they were nuclear engineers at mit they went to the fleet and they came back so that's your cadre in the class and then there's like two senior folks in the back of the classroom uh like jenny craig was my my cohort so he's a post command guy as well like this is and where the students were like done with their homework they were out you know out early and going to get dinner and we were there like you know, trying to figure hot it out. pockets and drinking coffee yeah. till like nine o'clock at night. At some point though, is the syllabus not just about neutrons and electrons? And I don't even know if I'm getting the terminology right, but <laughs> it's close. you're also a, a naval officer, but you'd done what? OOD underway, which we both did. Yeah. Um, but they need to teach you about at some point driving a ship. Yeah. At some point formalizing the leadership that we all pick up along the way, but sort of some, in some cases happenstance. Yeah. I mean, so, the, so the nuclear train is a big part of it and it's, but it's not the only part. Okay. Right. And that's, that includes not just academic portion, but hands on on the submarine trainers they have there in Charleston where you're actually standing watch and you're partnered with a 24 year old super sharp, like E5 who walks around the submarine reactor and you're learning how to do things like take the reactor critical. Um, and then you go from there, basically a year of that, you're going to go back to naval reactors for the more advanced graduate level specific to the reactor stuff you do in your, on the uh, aircraft carrier. That's a okay. you know, different platform. But you, do, you go through Newport and you learn how to – you're in the simulator, learn how to drive the ship a little bit. You're learning rules of the road. You're learning about you know how you run a ship and how you manage maintenance and stuff. But I, you know most of it is still going to be OJT. You're going to learn the most – Outside of the reactor stuff, which is very formalized and great training, is when you show up as the big XO, as we say, on the aircraft carrier. And now, you know, from it's a fire hose from day one to day last, and you're just trying to keep up with it. But like everything we do, you're surrounded by great people. Mm-hmm. Um, it's as much about personality and relationships as it is anything else. You know, you have to be humble enough to ask questions and learn. And then ideally, you have a CEO of the ship, the captain of the ship, who's going to be your mentor. And then you're going to learn. 90% of how it, you know, how to be a CEO by watching and observing or listening. And I had, uh, Captain Chris Bolt, Bolter, E2, um, E2 CEO, uh, CEO of the Reagan when I was a big XO. Now works for General Atomics. Great American, great friend. And, and he was a great mentor for me, uh, on, on all those things. And, you know, how to, how to be a great officer, how to be a great leader, how to manage an aircraft carrier because it's daunting. And it's no, it's no longer about work hard and, you know, you can get through it by just hard work. You have to learn how to delegate and trust and lead yeah. and, and worry about things like culture and, and your decisions you make affect now thousands of people, not just maybe hundreds or dozens. Yeah. Is the, am I right in assessing that it seems like the CO is the good cop, the XO is the bad cop on a, on a care? And yeah. is that by design or is that just the experiences maybe I feel like I had? I think, well, I mean, I think it's, it's, 
certainly that's the tradition, right? I remember mm. um, Bolter. So we were in, in the yards, and we had to wear hard hats for a good portion of the tour. And and so Bolter went and got um, two cowboy hats. Uh, so they're hard hat cowboy hats that you can wear to protect your head, and they're and they're they're allowed and certified. So he got one for himself that was white, and he got me one that was black. And he used to make me wear it around, and, I, and that's just not my personality. But he used yeah. to joke with it, and then the crew liked the idea that I would, that he'd make me wear the black hat, and I was called the black hat. Yeah. Where's the black hat? But you do, as the XO, you're worried about heads and beds and cleanliness and discipline, and you do XOIs you right. know, every week. So there's some expectation, but I, don't, I would argue you don't have to be the the bad cop. You just you have more disciplinary stuff you're worried about, and and things like you know just keeping keeping the train running is important. Yeah. You know, ideally you do all that, so then the CEO can worry about strategically relationships and where you're going and that just takes some days you can be more patient than others i guess but, yeah uh, but I don't know well our paths crossed again around this time because i was returning to north island which is where you were based on reagan yeah. and you guys were having a single day friends and family day cruise yeah. and i thought oh i would love to be a part of that hey chopper i'm your friend quote yeah. unquote yeah. and uh you arranged it for us thank you very much i took my whole family wife and three boys yeah. and uh, my brother rocky and his wife yeah, and two boys right. and we have some videos from that day they loved it and uh so i remember coming in and seeing you in your office and it was very clear to me that you were pretty well both respected and liked because i think you just I think you said to me at the time, you know, if you're just nice to these people and you tell them what you're thinking yeah. uh, and you get their inputs, yeah, they'll respond to that. And did you have like, was it a goldfish or something? They yeah, Or a beta yeah. fish or something? Yeah. What was that whole thing about? Yeah, I learned that when you're the ex of the ship, never leave on April Fool's Day. I went to a, a two-day <laughs> conference and came back and, and the bull ensign, the senior ensign on the ship. Okay. And remember, you have like 30 ensigns. So, you know, he's he's generally is a uh, prior enlisted LDO and, and Chris Hood is his name. He... He was the bull ensign and, and he ran rampant on the ship. I gave, and I gave him carte blanche. I wanted him to help build the culture and stuff. So long story short, I left. I came back and, and, uh, there in my, on my desk was a, a fish, goldfish that they named Little Chopper. Um, <laughs> because you were gone. Cause I was gone and, uh, <laughs> and they did other hijinks, but of course, long story short, it, like it became like the ship pet and, and like people would come by and peek their head in and then, you know, then we'd get underway and there was always questions about, you know, you can't have a ship. You can't have a live animal on a ship. Um, that's not allowed. And so then people were worried I was going to get in trouble and they were trying to cover for me. Like, like we're talking to people I'd never met before, but like <laughs> junior enlisted, they were like really worried about. Um, and then, of course, what happens to all goldfish? At some point, they, they die. Um, so we had this, we made, had this big memorial. Um, <laughs> we, we actually, at the end, when he passed away, they put him in a boot and, and when a shooter, someone on the flight deck that launches airplanes and, mm -hmm. When they leave, we launch their boots off a catapult. So you hook it up to the launch, you know, the, the shuttle and it off they go off the bow. So they took little chopper and they put him in a bag and put him in the shoe and they launched him and they all stood at attention and saluted. And then of course, um, the bull ensign was on the bridge and he did one, one stinger, one bell. And he said, little chopper departing on the entire ship of 5,000 while we were underway in the Pacific. And immediately my phone rang and it was the chief of staff for the admiral who said, you know, chopper. We rarely get the bells right for the admiral, you know, because it's you know, you're supposed to ring them on and off all the time. Right. Goes, Somehow you get it right for the fish, a dead uh, fish, no less, and a dead fish. Yeah. He goes, "You're gonna have to explain it to the admiral." I said, "Sure, I got it. I'll do that." <laughs> but isn't that the point, right? You've got all this serious stuff. If you're doing your job right, I feel like yeah. there should be room for a little of this, Absolutely. you know, levity. Yeah. It shouldn't always be. And of course, the chief of staff's job is to do that. Yeah, and and he and he's a great guy too. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you can, we talk about leadership, but I think having a positive culture matters. I yeah. think you just get more out of your team. I think it's a better place to work. It's a hard enough job as it is. Oh yeah, if you're gone for months on end, you leave your family and friends, and uh, and we ask a lot from. So the least you can do is make it an enjoyable place when you can. And, yeah. and, and knowing that you know there'll be times when it's going to be tough. There's going to be times when you ask a lot from young sailors or pilots or you know you name it. They're on the gamut, but. If you have a positive culture, I think that then it makes it an enjoyable place, and, yeah. and you can you can get a lot out of people that way. So that's always my motto. So you'd spent a lot of time all over the U.S. You went to Naples, Italy, and then for your deep draft. So now you're the XO, so they know that you can be involved with some of the reactor stuff going on and, yeah. and, and how a carrier works. But now they want to see you command a ship, but they're not going to send you straight to the carrier. So they sent you, as you said earlier, to the Blue Ridge, yeah. which was in Japan. Yeah, and so you've already been to Japan, but yeah. not this part. So different part, although I, I took the Reagan from San Diego to uh, Japan, to Yokosuka. So I, okay. that was part of the transition. We relieved the George Washington. We picked up Air Wing 5. And so my last six months, actually last eight months on the Reagan as the big XO was okay. in Japan. So I was familiar with the area. Sure. Uh, but I lived on the ship because I couldn't do a move yet. 
do the move rules. Um, and so it came back. There's another year of training um, before you then go to your deep trap. But I had selected for the Blue Ridge and knew that at that point, then Mary and I and the, the younger two boys were going to move to Japan for the for the Blue Ridge. But it was it's another year of training where you go back through more schooling, more navigation stuff. And, you know, at one point as I when I when I retired a couple years after that, I recognized it. In my 30 year naval career, I was in, in a training status for at least 10 years. Um, so, you know, one third of my time I was in classroom or in a training cockpit or whatever. And, and it's a testament to the training we do have in the mm-hmm. system to make sure you can do these transitions from helicopter pilot to fighter pilot to nuclear engineering to driving ships. And, and so I enjoyed that part of that yeah. in my career. But yeah, so you get yourself back out to the Blue Ridge and I was the, uh, the seal. You go right in to be the seal of the Blue Ridge. Um, Ooh command ship it was commissioned like in 1970 so it was the oldest and still is the oldest operational ship you know there's the constitution which is the oldest ship uh commissioned in the navy but the oldest operational ship yeah. is the blue ridge to this day so yeah. I, I used to joke that because the, the sailors would often say you know it's an old ship sir it's going to be hard to maintain i'm like it was actually commissioned the same year i was born so unless you can you know <laughs> we'll go out on the track right now and you can beat me then no but That's right. but it tried you know it was, it was a good ship and it has like teak quarter decks and it's got a history to it nice. um you know, had a lot of involvement in Vietnam and stuff. And, and yeah. these things are different. You know, it's an older ship. But it's when you take good care of it, it's a good ship. It'll well, treat you well. Right. And that's the point, right, is is things require maintenance, relationships, yeah. uh, professional and personal, and, and ships, maintenance, aircraft, all these things require involvement. Yeah. And so you just had to inspire those young folks to not basically use that excuse of, oh, it's old. That's why it broke. No, right. maybe it broke because we didn't do our, yeah. our checks or whatever. So. Yeah, or a little bit of both. You know, and in fact, I got there and the ship was uh, in dry dock, so it was not in the water. Oh, wow. uh, okay. So again, you know, it's a different environment for all of us and it's on blocks and, and one of these old, like, 100, 150 year old dry docks I have in Japan. Uh-huh. So we had to finish this maintenance. It took a long time. So yeah. when we finally got underway, like, almost eight months after I'd been there, I think I had, like, like 80% of the crew had never been underway, like, maybe ever. Like, oh, it just, wow. there was such a junior crew, you know, mm-hmm. on that ship at least, and maybe half had never been underway at all. So, so when we got underway the first time, we had built to this level of excitement where, like people didn't want to miss deployment. Like they didn't want to miss the underway because they were so excited. Because we've been talking about it for you know eight months or longer. Been actually been in maintenance for almost two years. Wow! So they were super excited to go to sea, which you knew would end at some point. Sure. Um, but the novelty didn't wear off at least initially. So it was pretty fun to take it to sea for the first time. You said earlier, out of a thirty-year career, you spent a third of it in formal training. Would you agree with me though? You spent the full thirty years learning something, right? Yeah, I mean, every day you're out at sea. You're the commanding officer of this vessel commissioned by the navy yeah. and you've been given that honor and yet you're not dare i say the be it all know it all you're probably right. learning something even as a commanding officer no that's a great distinction you know because yeah you every day i mean today you know my current job i'm learning new stuff every single day so yeah it's it's definitely a lot of ojt you know it's just i was always amazed looking back how much now that i, I spend time in the in the non-military realm of things non-profit world specifically you just don't have the time or the money to be able to put that much training and effort into educating your folks you try to do it along the way mm-hmm. so i look back at my career and i God, what a what an incredible organization that's willing to spend that much time money and resource for me to train for 10 of those 30 in a training status where i wasn't like you know on the front lines where i wasn't you know even even in a staff job i was actually in a train status which i thought was pretty cool yeah. So you know, definitely a student mindset but the activities we perform as naval officers require that degree yeah. of yeah. intensive training yeah. i mean land, think about what you've done alone landing helicopters on the back of very small ships landing fixed wing fighters on carriers yeah. and then driving those ships working with allies doing all these things yeah. so when you are on blue ridge someone's evaluating you and at some point you have yet another mile milestone or a selection that not everybody makes the cut uh so you know maybe you're starting to read the tea leaves but what's it like and how did it work for you when someone says yeah. hey you know what chopper um we're going to give you command of a what 12 billion dollar yeah. ninety-eight thousand ton four and a half acres of american sovereignty which by the way we have what a 10 or 11 of yeah 11 so yeah i mean I mean, you know, I mean, you're tracking, you know, the, the, the odds are in your favor to say, I mean, at that point, because there's so few right. that have gone through, uh, the pipeline, but, but it's the culmination of that tenure of, you know, training was you dedicate to nuclear power training, right? So I'd done the nuke school and, uh, and then big XO tour and then deep draft tour. And then at some point you're being looked at for command of a carrier, sequential command is what they call it. Um, yeah. And I, in fact, I remember I was underway in the Blue Ridge. It was early morning. Admiral Cooper, who was my, my boss, called me and I, I'm, Mount Fuji was like 
in the background to me. It was a gorgeous day. I'm like, it was a pretty good day, you know. And and the Blue Ridge had these massive bridge wings, so I could sit out there on the chair in the morning. But uh, I remember him calling me, uh, and 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 yeah, so I was very excited. I mean. Because I knew that, I also knew that was kind of the culmination of my operational career. Anything that came after that wouldn't matter, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you can go on and be an admiral, you can go on and do staff stuff. But for me, I knew that's going to be my last kind of pinnacle operational tour, as it were. And, uh, yeah, so pretty excited. Didn't know where, which, which mattered, right? Because now I'd spent so much time like her on the West Coast or Hawaii that we knew there was a chance we'd get up in Norfolk. Uh, we'd come back to Japan on the Reagan. Um, but as luck would have it, I, I got assigned the, the Theodore Roosevelt a couple months later in San Diego. So. And did you go from Blue Ridge straight to, with, of course, some little, Schools probably here. Yeah, no, another almost another year again of training. Oh wow, another yeah, year. You okay. go back through naval reactors for kind of a brush up. Uh, you go back to Newport to rules of the road, simulators, okay. stuff like that. Uh, mm-hmm. Then you go back to the FRS to the, the RAG to fly again. So I got to go back now now to VFA one twenty two and learn how to fly the Super Hornet for the first time. Oh wow! So that was part of my syllabus, and then you CQ as well. So that's obviously the most important piece for anyone, and that's kind of the, another carrot at the end. Like sure. You're going to screen for aircraft carrier, carrier, um, and you get to go fly again on your own ship. On yeah, on your own ship. Yeah. It's pretty <laughs> so neat. when is so? Where are we now in history? What what, what month? Oh, year is this? so this is 19. Yeah. So 19, like summer okay. 19. And you had not flown since leaving VFA 94. Yeah, I mean, I, I did in, some probably backseat flights and helicopter flights when I was the big XO in the Reagan, but not okay. not in control uh, or you know as a co-pilot. Yeah, so I. My last flight uh, would have been, um, yeah, skipper of VFA 94 for my very last flight because my change command for VFA 94 was a flyby change command. Oh, well. yeah. And what year was that? Man, oh, 20, I didn't warn you about that one. I know, 2010. 2010. Ten, so summer nine, 2010. nine years. So nine years. Okay. So you go back up to. Yeah, so back Lamar, up to the war. But now you're wearing. Eagles, you know, yeah. and everybody knows you're going to go do this thing. And so you can like move people out of your way. Not that you would. Yeah. Um, but right. It, it's like, yeah, they're going to, they're going to treat you well. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's quick syllabus. You have to go through the academics first. I'd never flown the Super Hornet. So I'd understand the differences there. Um, you do, you do a bunch of simulators and mm-hmm. then, uh, you know, and then you get a, I think it's like you have two flights with a instructor in the back and a, a two seat training bird and then you're on your own and, and, you don't, I mean, you're not, so to be fair, you're not going to learn tactical stuff. Like, no. you know, you can do that if you have time. And I think I had a couple extra tactical flights just to be proficient, but most of it's going to be f- focused on the basics and flying currency, but then, and then going right into FCLPs to get ready to go to the boat. Cause you have to be allowed to see CQ on the boat daytime only. Yeah. Hey, um, yeah, I bet you weren't arguing too much arguing. on that. I was not looking, <laughs> although you do night, you do night practice, but yeah. So yeah. So when I went back to the boat on the Nimitz, uh, to CQ daytime only, yeah, it had been 14 years since my last trap. Did you perform better than you expected, maybe? Less well yeah. about what you expected? I mean, because sometimes that age isn't necessarily yeah. a hindrance because other things kind of creep in and those old muscle memory skills yeah. come back. It was surprising how quickly things came back. I get never yeah. flown the Super Hornet before, but it flies the same, right? Uh, it floats a little bit differently on the back of the boat. And um, I, I felt like I did better. Like, I was yeah. worried, like, and I didn't, I didn't want to tell people, like, you know, it's been like 14 years. Like, I didn't make that part of the brief briefing item. Um, but it came back surprisingly quickly, um, and particularly daytime, right? And then quickly you're like, man, this is the best thing ever. You know, not only is it daytime only, um, but it's your own ship in some cases. And, what, you know, initially I see Q on the Nimitz. So, you know, my, my buddy Max Clark was a, was a skipper of the Nimitz, and he took some pictures. He's like, you look pretty happy up there. Um, but then, you know, you're, then you see Q, and then you go back, and uh, and then you finish your training and head back to your boat to – to get ready for the change command and take over the carrier. Yeah, which is a lot of pomp and circumstance, big wigs, uh, sometimes news coverage. Yeah, there's some news. Yeah. And, uh, and and you have, I mean, there's a 30 days of turnover. So by design, you're there 30 days prior to learn the ship, walk around the ship. Um, I got a chance to, to follow Carlos Sardiello, who was the captain at the time, a great mm-hmm. guy who really sh- was gracious and, you know, was very nice and hosted me. And because and, it could be, you know, it could be different with a new CEO coming right behind you. But he was sure. more than gracious, good. Um, showed me around, took a great care of me. I was I was pretty excited to take over for him. He had built a pretty yeah. good crew and a pretty good culture on that ship. And like you said, depending on and you saw this in your own experiences as commanding officers, really, it's about timing. You ended yeah. up at VFA 94 that just happened to be going UDP. You ended up at Blue Ridge, which happened to be eight months of the end of its uh, in dock time. Yeah. You get to the Theodore Roosevelt and right on deployment or right on deployment. Yeah. Basically got there. 
did a couple underways just to, for shakedown, one with Carlos and one with that. And then we went out for Comp 2X, which is kind of the culmination mm-hmm. uh, of your training, your certification before you then head out and deploy. So, yeah, we did that in basically the fall of 2019. Finished up Comp 2X, which is great. Was great training for me because it's when you see the team at the top of their game, right? You're yeah. you're not at the basics of blocking and tackling. You're at the advanced stage for the training, and you've got the adversaries and submarines, and you're working as an entire strike group together. So it was a great chance for me to learn a lot very yeah. quickly and see where the team was and kind of get an assessment of the team that I had inherited from Los. Uh, and then we went on deployment uh, about a month later in January of 2020. But when you're underway, whether it's the first day right away or maybe it's a couple of days in, and you're up on the bridge. Is there a moment of realization and almost maybe, I don't know if it's a pinch me or a holy cow, what am I doing? But I mean, is there a moment where like, I'm the guy who's in charge of this thing? Yeah. I mean, you find yourself looking around to see who's really in charge. Like, you know, like, you know, you realize, I guess, because people will go look to you for a lot of direction and a lot of, a lot of questions. And you oftentimes go like, I guess I am the guy that makes that call. Right. <laughs> um, so you have to, but um, yeah. And there's times too, where you're like, you know, when I was a JO or, you know, on, on my first carrier um the captain of the ship seemed like he was you know 50 years older than me right he seemed like he had been doing the navy (laughs) since like you know the days of actual nimitz and um and so then to find yourself there you're like i don't feel that old that's right you know and it was true throughout our career right same thing as a department head same thing as a skipper um you kind of reflect back on that same thing as a big so and then and then by the time you're the carrier ceo you're like i don't like i just don't it's i don't feel like i'm the person i thought would be in charge of a carrier yeah um, but you also, you, you also recognize and you feel comfortable and confident that you, you've had a lot of training to get there. And you also realize you have a good team. I mean, you put your A team on an aircraft carrier from your supply officer to your head judge to your operations officer. You have an incredible team and you've learned at that point in your career how to manage a large organization and how to leverage the skills, the strengths of your team and, and, and where you have to fill in. But, um, a lot of it comes down to trust and, and yeah. trust in the people and knowing, getting to know them. So I spent a lot of time trying to get to know my, my hodge, right? Your heads of department, mm-hmm. knowing that they were going to make a break, you know, the ship's success. And, uh, they were, they were phenomenal. I had a pretty good crew. So I felt pretty lucky to yeah. have them. You can't do it on your own and you, you have to rely on that team. Yeah. You have to develop that team. You yeah. have to mentor them as well. You I mean, very little, you're not actually. just the decision maker. You're sort yeah. of the head everyone's looking to for setting this, the tone yeah. for the ship and the way business Absolutely. is going to be done. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're not driving the bus, right? You're not even in the middle of the bus. You might even not be on the bus, but you're the one like looking down range of, Hey, mm-hmm. where we need to go? How do we need, how do we get ready for deployment? How do we get ready for what's after deployment? What are we thinking about for the next deployment? And some days you might feel like you're the only person looking two, three years down, down road, but that's okay. I mean, you just help to drive the team and, and, uh, and empower them to make yeah. those decisions. If you get my, you know, my sense was if I got mired in the micromanagement of day to day stuff on a ship as a carrier CEO, I wouldn't be able to accomplish anything else. I would not be able to like look down range. I wouldn't be able to fly. I mean, I was I, in my, in my mind, if I wanted to fly as a carrier CEO, whether it was a helicopter, uh, or, you know, in a super hornet, I better figure out how to delegate and be comfortable doing that. And then, uh, and that way I could comfortably go fly as much as I, as I wanted. Um, did you get back in the front seat of the 60? Uh, I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Did that require formal training or they just said, no, oh, no, I just, cause I didn't have to sign for the aircraft. Okay. So I always had an right. aircraft commander, but I, I generally try to fly helicopter one day a week and then, you know, two or three or, or one or two uh, extra uh, super hornet flights mm-hmm. as a tanker or double SC or, I did some cap stuff like near uh, south in the South China Sea, which I always thought was you know maybe the wrong place to be, but nothing <laughs> happened, and the the J eights are out there didn't come after me, so yeah. that was good. By February 2020, you are on top of the world. You're in command of a yeah. nuclear powered aircraft carrier, one of ten. You're flying helicopters that you had done at your earliest point in your career as a young lieutenant. You're flying the Super Hornet, which was new to you. But yeah. as the carrier CEO, you have that luxury. And the world is starting to hear these rumblings about something coming yeah. out of China, maybe, or wherever it's coming from. But there is this problem. And now we're starting to hear the words COVID. What's happening on board Theodore Roosevelt? What's What are some of the first indications to you that, okay, this is more than just something yeah. we're hearing outside of our ship? Because you're fairly well inculcated yeah. there. But what, what what are some of the first issues you're having on board the ship yeah so you know we instantly start thinking things like logistics and we think about you know to support an aircraft carrier at sea in the pacific there are certain logistic hubs and we need to get stuff so 
our initial worry is going to be we're going to shut down and lose the hubs that we fly goods and supplies to and then put on a cod to fly out to the carrier. And we're thinking about port calls and we're thinking about what's our schedule look like. So we, we are, we're tracking the world numbers. We're tracking the regional numbers. We're tracking, you know, counts every day and the countries that are around and looking at our port calls as well. So, right. you know, we knew we were going to pull in the Guam, which had a low, if not zero, not wasn't zero, but we had a low rate or concern with Guam, our initial port call. Uh, so we were have, able to have a full Liberty port and it was still kind of, I guess, in the back of our minds. We weren't really worried about it or concerned at that point. We didn't know enough about it, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And then we left Guam to then head to our next port call, which was going to be Vietnam, which we knew at that point was going to be a little bit closer to the potential epicenter if it's actually in Wuhan, China, which is what we suspect at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but we didn't know a lot. I mean, there was a lot of questioning, and, this, and it's all good. I mean, the world didn't know, and the Navy was probably, I think, always one step ahead of where the general public was at large. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think the decision, but then the decision was made to pull into Vietnam for many reasons. It was significant that it was a normalization of relations with Vietnam, like the 25th anniversary, so there was a big event plan with the stuff on the pier. Um, Vietnam is a good port, um, and, and we were tracking their numbers, and they had a l- low, if not zero, rate of COVID at the time um, in the southern part of, of Vietnam where we were going to pull in Danang. So we, we knew there was a risk, and we, we minimized that and mitigated that to the best of our ability by, by removing stuff from the ship. Normally, a ship pulls in, you have a big event on the ship, and you mm-hmm. have tours. So we kind of curtailed that and stopped most of, almost all those tours. Um, we had some medical department interaction. We were going to go to the hospital out in Vietnam and Danang and then bring them on. And we said that's probably high risk because if there's anybody that's, you know, that's sick, um, cause we knew we weren't testing as well, not just us on the ship, but at large that the world and certainly that part of Vietnam was not able to test like at a daily basis. So whether they had positive cases or not, we were, we were going to question that because they just weren't able to test. And, um, and so even the big party that we generally hold on the carrier, the big top, we call it, we bring ambassador type level and four star type level folks to, we, you know, we, you know, looked at it and I said, you know, we just don't want to do it on a ship. I think it's problematic to get everybody on. It just, it's going to run the risk that we can't bet these people. We can check for things at this point, like temperature and we can look for symptoms, but it's again, if you're in the early stages of COVID, as we know now, you have no symptoms, but you can still be contagious. So, right. so we moved the event and limited the event to offshore at a big hotel there in Da Nang and, and uh, we're able to pull it off again pretty quickly and throw a pretty neat event um, and that met all the intent of the high level engagement and the ambassador and everybody or the, the representative was there. And, and so we had that event and then two days later we're scheduled to pull out. I remember um, the morning before, so this, I think it was a Sunday morning, we're going to pull out. We were going to go surf. We had a surfing trip planned to go surf uh, in Da Nang. Da Nang, you know, there's a beach there. So surf in Vietnam, like we all saw in movies growing up. And so that I had a group and we were all going to go surfing that morning. And I remember getting the call that late that night. Um, and we got indications that there was Vietnam was letting us know there were positive cases of COVID in Da Nang and that there were two, two British national citizens that had traveled from Hanoi that had been exposed that were positive and they were staying at a hotel that we had sailors at. So we kind of knew at that point things had changed or started to change dramatically and, mm-hmm. and we're able to contain that and we're able to test that and we're able to work with the Vietnamese government there to then, you know, quarantine them and then bring those folks back on the ship because we did not want to leave them in Vietnam. I mean, I, I was adamant that I was not going to leave U.S. sailors in Vietnam. I figured that that would probably not go over well publicly. And so we brought them on and we quarantined them. Carrier's big enough. You can put those sailors in a in a large room, male and female. We can feed them. We can test them. We can provide them, you know, everything they need. To, and so we, and then we quarantined them for two weeks underway because the ship got underway, never got to surf. And then we got underway and then went two weeks, kind of kept our fingers crossed, started operating. And, in fact, went through the two weeks and none of them tested positive. Hmm. Um, so we kind of thought we had dodged the bullet at that point and said, man, we made it. And we knew at that point we were going to change our schedule. We were probably not going to stay in that part of the world. We're not going to go to some of our other port calls yeah. that we scheduled. And it was like two days later that I get the call from our senior medical doc at like, again, two in the morning, which is when you get most bad news calls. Uh, and, and, you know, you don't sleep a lot as a captain of the ship anyways, but we're underway in the South China Sea. There's always traffic. So you're always kind of on alert and you might sleep for a couple hours as a captain of the ship, you know, and then you go up on the bridge to make sure that, you know, there's not too many fishing boats and your team's got it handled. But got the call from the from the ship's senior medical officer, Navy captain. And then he's like, Captain, we got uh, we just tested two sailors positive for covid and they were not part of the, the initial 39 or so that we had that were had we had quarantined. These are two sailors that have been in this yeah. sailor population. Yeah, so, so. They likely picked it up, not positive, but likely picked it up somewhere in Vietnam. 
took a couple weeks. But you also know at that point, for anyone who's been on a carrier, it is almost impossible to socially distance at all. So mm-hmm. our worry was they've been exposed to hundreds of people, realistically. So we started the contact tracing that we all kind of became familiar with. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we quickly went from not just the two that had tested positive that were able to get off the ship and fly back to Guam, but the contract the contact tracing um, – suddenly incorporates almost like the entire ship. I mean, we got to a thousand people by the time we pulled into Guam later, at least a thousand people had fallen in this realm of, of, you know, exposure and, and, you know, through a contact tracing kind of methodology. Um, and we knew it was more, I mean, there's just, again, there's no way you can segregate. And we did our best with a thousand. We saw our positive numbers continue to grow exponential exponentially. Um, we were getting them off the ship as fast as we could to Guam. Cause again, we didn't know what to expect on the back end. And we were, we were tracking fatality rates across the world at large, which is about 4%. We knew that, you know, the Navy population is way too healthy. I, I wasn't thinking it was 4%. I was, you know, thinking it was under 1% is worst case. And that's where we're going to plan to and mitigate to. Mm-hmm. But even 1% of 100 is too many and 1% of 1,000 is too many. So we were going to do all we could to make sure we, we could mitigate that. And uh, so we had a, uh, a Navy medicine team on board that was there to help us test and run tests and and check out symptoms and but you know we were still short masks and and tests and we you know we didn't have tests for everybody we had tests and we do 200 people at a time basically in a petri dish and then kind of from there isolate down to who might be positive but um you know again like always making doing the best we could and trying to figure it out we had stopped all logistics stuff so at one point everyone thought in the world that potentially covid could survive on cardboard so what is a ship generally you know how do sailors get stuff on the ship that they can't buy on the ship they order from Amazon and then it, you know, it's shipped into the next port and we'll pick it up. So we had thousands of boxes of Amazon stuff that was waiting for us in Guam that we wouldn't bring on. We kept it, we kept it under sequestration so we didn't have to bring it on to, if there was any exposure. There was a lot of uncertainty at the beginning, yeah, right? We just absolutely. didn't know. We knew war. this thing was, yeah, was absolutely. spreading rapidly. There were deaths. And yeah. to your point, the Navy, for the most part, is full of young, healthy people. Yeah. Uh, some of the deaths were elderly or otherwise compromised. But when yeah. was your port visit in Vietnam? Was that early March? Early March. Yeah. Okay. So that was around. So I was in California at the time and things were beginning to shut down yeah. in early March. So now you're making your way to Guam and now cases are arriving. Yeah. What's the reception you're getting from Guam? Is it come in, you're safe here or don't well, come in? So now you get to the political realm. Like is, you know, is that the right place to pull in? What are you going to do when you do pull in? Mm-hmm. How do you spread people out? Cause being on board the carrier any longer than you have to is not a great way to mitigate the spread. Um, you know, what kind of facilities do you have available on the pier? You know, do they even get to go outside on the pier? And we were, and you had to be mindful of, the, of Guam itself. And we didn't want to pretend we we're going to expose the Guam. Guam is generally an, an older population at large, uh, with, you know, some higher risk factors. So we didn't want to make, put them at any higher risk. And those are the things that we were dealing with at a very high political level. I'm sure, you know, in DC, those were front, you know, on the front burner of things they were worried about, um, which we were concerned with too. We just knew that what we were doing wasn't working and we were seeing the exponential growth. And we, and it wasn't that we weren't getting support. We just weren't, we, our sense of timeliness and how, how quickly we needed to respond was maybe different than others. And, and that was probably, if there's any rub between what we, what I want and what we want on the, t- on the, on the ship, we, we just wanted to move faster. Mm-hmm. And, and we were seeing the exponential growth of positive cases to support that. And a carrier is very healthy, but you saw people that have, you know, serious ailments, right? They can have different levels of diabetes and stuff that might make them more at risk or heart, former heart, you know, prior heart issues and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, so we, we were, you know, we did our best to, to get them off the ship, obviously, and we took advantage of what was available on Guam once we pulled in. Um, but you know, there's even to pull an aircraft carry in to, you know, pier side takes a lot of work. And so we, you know, I was, I remember at the time just trying to be focused on the closest alligator, right? Like what's the most important thing? Well, right now, the day we're pulling in is to pull in safely. Like nothing else matters. Let's pull in safely, get the lines over, and then we can worry about it. And, you know, we'd been worrying about it up to that point, but at that day of, right, this mm-hmm. is like, like flying. You have to prioritize and you have to compartmentalize. And I had to, my focus while we were underway at least was let's focus on the closest alligator, which that day, like say, we're pulling in. That's all that matters. Like don't, don't be distracted by COVID. It's not going to kill you today. And let's focus on pulling in safely. And that, and that's a hard task with a ship of 5,000. And trying to explain that with all the uncertainty, right? We're all much more comfortable about it now. We're all, you know, we all got tired of wearing masks about a year ago, two years ago. But, but at the time, there was a lot of uncertainty, and there's, and it's hard because no one, I mean, the world didn't know how to deal with it. So um, that was my became my focus, and and then became my primary concern once we were safely pier side was okay. You know, we've been talking about it. We've been talking about getting support and moving everybody out of the ship. 
how do we best mitigate? How do we do that so we can mitigate the risk right. of the spread? Because that's that was our best defense was to stop the spread. Yeah. Um, and because we just didn't know what the impact it was going to have. No, we didn't. And we, of course, have the benefit of hindsight now. So my family of five, just to continue that story in, in California, huddled together. We did what we had to do and it was fine. We survived. We had stores. We had things yeah. that could come here. You had a family of 5,000 yeah. and you weren't just huddled. You had a mission to do, yeah. right? You guys are deployed as part of national policy and, yeah. and all that. How did that start playing into, right? You're, you're trying to do the right thing for the troops, but you also right. have, in fact, your boss is on your ship. Even though you're in command of yeah. the ship, your boss is there. That's the strike group commander. And he has to also answer to other people. Right. Are there other pressures now coming in? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're, when you're out operating the South China Sea, you have a Chinese ship within a mile at all times. Very professional, but they're out there. So that's, it's never lost on you, the mission at hand and why mm-hmm. you're out there. And like you said, it's a, it's a $12 billion asset with 5,000 people and you're out there for a reason and you can't lose sight of that part of the mission. Um, and so when we made this, and I say we, cause it wasn't, you know, I can't pull in the carrier by myself, uh, you know, without approval. There's a lot of higher decisions that have to happen. So we were getting the support we needed to pull in. We were getting this, the support we needed to make those decisions to move the carrier and, and basically put, say the mission's going to be secondary right now. Let's get the ship in and focus on the crew. And, that, and the Navy was very good about that as all the way the entire Department of Defense. Um, the information you can imagine is challenging because now we get, once we're pier side, we're now worried about, you know, how do you count positive cases? How do you know they're positive if it's just symptoms? And so now we kind of got, I guess, in the quagmire and the fog of war of, you know, you know, what is the true story on the front lines? And I, you know, we consider ourselves on the front line of the COVID fight at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and how do we get the information clearly to our higher ups so we can make the right decision on what to do next and whether that's, eventually put them in hotels so we can clearly isolate them and let them, you know, and, and quarantine them. Um, all those things were at play. Do we, do we send people somewhere else so we can put them in the right kind of facilities? And, um, and that's where it probably was the harder part. I was operation. I think we were pretty good and pretty focused on getting the ship safely pier side. You know, my, in my frustration, obviously at the time was I, then I don't feel we, I didn't feel we were moving quick enough to get sailors the next, the next level of help they needed, which is to get them somewhere, whether the CDC compliant or not didn't matter, but get them somewhere safely off the ship. As we know now, fresh air matters and having your own space matters to kind of reduce the spread. And, and, uh, and that's maybe where we came, you know, where, where at the end, that's kind of the, the friction I had mm-hmm. um, with senior leadership. And, and it's not for ill. And I think everybody wanted the best thing for the sailors, no doubt. I just right. don't think everybody wanted it as well or as much as I did yeah. at the time. And that's, that's understandable based on my position as a CEO of the ship, ultimately accountable for everybody on board. Um, and, and not necessarily as worried about the greater mission. At that point, I knew the most important thing, the closest alligator for me then mm-hmm. was the sailors on board, and I wanted to get them help they could, and they yeah. needed. And it's not just a few dozen. This is 5,000 people, and yeah. you can't put them all in hotel room, number one. That's a lot of hotel yeah. rooms at great cost. But number two, someone's got to manage the ship, even – Pier side, as you well know, I don't have to tell you, yeah, yeah. with the lines over, there's still a yeah, lot have, of people. You know, without getting specific, you have hundreds of people that had to remain on the ship no yeah. matter what to yeah. operate the ship and just to make sure it's safe. And so, you know, there, there were actually a lot of hotel rooms, which is going to ultimately ends up being the solution to the problem. Um, and that's what the Navy was able to take, you know, to get. And, right. and, uh, you know, and so that's, I think we got to the same point and then how to best take care of it and do yeah. it. And then we, and then we work through it. And Is your chain of command somewhat saturated by reports from other people, maybe like you? In other words, you're trying to figure it out in your universe. They're also trying to figure yeah. it out. And you're just another person like, Hey, we got an issue here. Yeah. You know, here's an issue from over here. Here's an issue from over there. I mean, how saturated was the chain of command? Yeah. I mean, I think if you go over the top, they're saturated by, you know, everyone in America, everyone in the world at some point, everybody's asking for information right. or trying to get decisions. And it's hard and you can't, uh, you know, it was, it was not easy for anybody. Um, you know, I think at that point you just have to do what you can. Like, I, like I can't solve all those problems. Like I knew like I wasn't gonna be able to solve the problem for the Navy at large. I could propose a solution for, for my team and the folks on the ship, um, which is ultimately what I did. Um, but I, I just couldn't worry about it, but I, but knowing full well that all this stuff was at play, right. You knowing that there were other ships out there, there's other aircraft carriers there, mm-hmm. you know, the Chinese are still out there. Whoever is still out there watching and monitoring. So it's not like you can just stop and take a time out. I mean, you have to make these decisions knowing that there's operational risk still at hand and operational priorities. Yeah. 
At what point do you decide to yourself, I'm either not getting the support I need or I just need to go wider? Because this is the part now where yeah. your name starts to become popular. Maybe that's not the right word, uh, but you yeah. know, it Notice. starts to be noticed. <laughs> noticed yeah. Um, because there's some publicity around an aircraft carrier commanding officer is speaking out because he doesn't believe the support is happening. So what, yeah. what's leading up until the, the hours before that letter is written or maybe, maybe the letter is written and then later it's sent elsewhere? Yeah, I, mean, it's, I will say one, it's collective, meaning that you know I, I certainly never made it in a vacuum. I have all these trusted advisors, medical teams and yeah. operational teams, and, and I'm taking advice from other captains on the ship that aren't necessarily, you know, the air wing commander, those, those kind of folks were all involved in, in discussions all day long, every day. So we yeah. got to figure out what the best, because they equally are concerned about their own sailors and responsibilities. Um, you know, what's unique about being a captain of the ship is ultimately you're accountable for a lot. I mean, you know, you are accountable for good order and discipline on the entire ship. Uh, and, and that in some cases, you know, means you are the most senior person. Now, the admiral is my boss, you know, the admiral at the time, who's a good guy. Um, he has operational stuff at, at large, but as a captain of the ship, you can never, you never delegate your accountability, right? You're always accountable. Um, and so I was always eager and, and interested in the experts, the medical experts we had brought on board, the medical experts that were already part of the team. Well, the logistics, the operational, operational piece, um, you know, what was the estimates? To, what would it cost to put people in hotels? Mm -hmm. All that stuff we had talked through. And, and meanwhile, we're watching, though, as predicted, the exponential growth of, of the positive cases on the ship. And, again, if you go back to our worst case 1%, well, when you get to 1,000 people or more, which we had, you know, one, even if 1% one, you know, 1 we knew was still going to be a high estimate, well, I, you know, I didn't want one, right? You know, right. We, we spent a lot of time taking care of people, helping them out. You know, if you're going to step on a ladder, you have to have a cranial over three feet. We do all these things to mitigate risk. In my mind, we better do all we can to mitigate this risk. Or, or you know, even if it's 0.01% of a 1,000, that's still going to be one person that's right. or more. And so that's that I wouldn't, I didn't want to happen. Um, you know, so at some point, you know, we just weren't getting the traction that we wanted and that I wanted. Um, and there was discussions about how to handle that. And I, you know, I, in the end, I, I wrote an email, um, that I let a lot of people see, meaning that I, did, I didn't send in a vacuum, but I knew it was going to be my email. It was coming from my account. I'm signing it. But I wanted to make sure I wasn't totally off base. But I also own it. I mean, I, this not their responsibility. My responsibility is the entire ship. Mm -hmm. um, and and I you know I called it a red flare. Right? I was sending a signal to, to my bosses to say, look, I know we're all working really hard at this. Uh, I, I apologize because I didn't make this a bigger deal like two or three days ago when I was really worried about it. And now I'm worried if we don't take action now, um, that we're going to get to tipping point. We're going to get to four to 5,000 positive cases, in which case, you know, that point zero one means a lot more. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, and I said, but I, but again, I said, I'm ultimately accountable and there's ever a time for me to act now. Yeah. And then we had done a study collectively to support that using example cases of the time with the diamond princess cruise ship and others that had kind of gone through a similar scenario. Hmm. Um, so I felt comfortable sending it and I, and I'll, you know, again, I sent it to mostly the aviators in my chain of command that, that were the action, the folks I knew would take action. The folks I knew that might not like my method, but they knew they were going to take action. And ultimately they did. They did exactly what I, what I had hoped in many cases, stuff was already going on, but it certainly brought everything out in the open and, and, and allowed us to continue those efforts. So if there was any, if there were any second guessing before that, I don't think there was after the email, um, they, they knew, I'm convinced they knew that it was a bigger problem than they realized. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of different ways to communicate, of course, in general, but especially in the military. We have messages, naval messages. We have email. We have even secret email. Um, we have phone calls. We have yeah. different ways. Was your email considered maybe by some a breach of what would be considered normal? Or was that? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, yeah, so there's yeah. a second guessing that I could use a different method. I think it's important to remember that all our medical correspondence uh, was in the unclassified network at that point because mm -hmm. most medical professionals do not have zipper down in your medical spaces. So both on and off the ship, it was unclassified networks. Um, so that's kind of why I chose that, that path, knowing that the information we were going to, we we're going to send, uh, to the, to the senior people on the email could then have that vetted, validated, verify, whatever you want to say by their own medical folks. So, mm -hmm. and I also knew it was quicker. It's easier to send unclass and get somebody to, to read it when on a time that you're, you, yeah. you know, you want to expedite. So yeah, definitely could have sent a shipper. Now the fact that we were pure side, the fact that we were having COVID cases, remember we had 5,000 sailors on board. Everyone has a cell phone. We were in cell phone range. So you couldn't hide the fact that we were pure side. You couldn't hide the fact we had COVID. You couldn't hide the fact that we were, you know, having this, these challenges. 
So it wasn't, and I don't think it was announcing anything other than it got more attention, mm-hmm. but it wasn't announcing anything that wasn't already known in the, in the public sphere, as it were. Uh, yeah. And, then, you know, and when you send something to, let's say, a two, three, or four star admiral, that person has a staff. So are you also including on this email uh, yeah. executive assistants and? Yeah, yeah. So it was, you know, essentially it was 10 people. It was like some of the senior people on the ship mm-hmm. and then the, the admirals uh, in the chain of command and then their executive assistants. So like okay. knowing that, you know, the admiral might or might not have time to read the email, but his EA might see it and then forward it to him. Right. Yeah. So it was a small group. I mean, it was 10 and, and people that I know. And, and, you know, and the response was quick. And, with, you know, in some cases it was, thanks for the red flare. We got you. You know, we got you. We're going to give you the help you need. Others was, call me. Let's talk about this and mm-hmm. make sure they understand it. I mean, I, I you know, I knew that it was going to ruffle feathers. So I won't pretend that I knew, you know, that I thought otherwise. And I knew it would come at risk of my career. But I felt strongly enough that, you know, when given the choice to do something or not do something, I, I knew that if I didn't do something and it went south, that I would always regret it and I felt responsible for my crew. If I did something and it got the action I wanted, I could live with everything else that came with that. Um, and so it wasn't, obviously nothing's black and white, but I knew that as I did my own evaluation on the decision to send it and get the attention, I knew I could live with any ramification as long as it got the support that we needed. And the end it did. What made you think that? Was it the wording you used? Was it the method you used? Was it the people you addressed? No, I mean, the people I addressed, I addressed for a reason because I knew they would be supportive. Um, I knew that, you know, there was a normal battle rhythm where we would discuss every day the COVID cases and we were trying to count numbers and, and really get down on the minutia of it from afar. We were trying to provide this information to people that weren't on the ship. And so it's the fog of war knowing that if we have, assume we have ground truth on the ship or as close to it as you can, mm-hmm. as you go up the chain of command, as you go to commands that are outside, maybe all the way back to DC. By the time it gets there, it's the whole telephone game, right? What they're hearing is probably different than what, what you're hearing right here. So, right. you know, I, that's not normal, certainly for me to, to go direct to all the folks in my chain of command. Uh, all aviators, I knew they would, they would take action, which is why I addressed it to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I knew that, you know, I, I knew that they were going to just be frustrated that that, you know, at that point that, and that was the complaint that, you know, someone said, like, you could have just called me. I said, well, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time. I feel like this this is something I would think you're aware of. But in my mind, if it gets, I'm willing to take the risk that this gets the action I need, uh, even if it ruffles feathers, because I didn't go through this nice PowerPoint brief that was going to align it for you, right, or whatever the case might be. I didn't have time for that. Never uh, die by PowerPoint. Yeah. But your immediate supervisor, as I understand, your boss, the person evaluating you, is on your ship. Yeah. Was he one of the recipients? He was. Yeah. So yeah. had you not? Because you had said earlier, you ran this by Air Wing Commander, you ran this by probably yeah. your XO and others. Was he part of that uh, vetting? No. no, he was part of the discussions we had on board, mm-hmm. and he knew. And 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 so, and I'll be honest, he came down and talked. And um, and before, and, and after, after, after it was okay. sent, he came right down. And 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 a great guy, and, and very compassionate, equally concerned for the sailors as well. And and asked me the question, and I, in my response was, you know, sir, I. You know, I, I knew if I had asked you for permission, you would have been obligated to say no. Um, even though I know you're aware of the problem, I'm willing to take the heat for this and I want to send it. And now, now you have, you can deny that you knew about it. Um, and, that, but at least I know I've gotten to the right people that will take action. Ask for permission to send the email. Yeah. Or, or, you know, cause he knew, he knew of the issue. He knew mm-hmm. of where we stood. Mm-hmm. But, if, you know, if I had said, Hey, do you want me to, you, you want to bet this before I send it? Cause he probably would have sent it himself, to be honest. However, I also didn't want to put him in that spot. I also didn't want to delay a day or two to worry about it. And I, you know, and if there's one regret I have and all that is I didn't give him the chance to, you know, to speak up on behalf of the crew. But I also felt like that was my responsibility as the captain of the ship. I owned it. I was accountable yeah. and I didn't want to. I didn't want him to think he had to send it or put him in a spot where he had to say no. And then I'd have to just do it anyways. Um, so this email goes out on day one, let's call it. At what point does the world begin picking up on it? I mean, I remember, like I said, hearing yeah. your name on the news. I was like, I know that guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it that initial group of about 10 that somebody's putting it out there? Or do you decide to launch a second wave? What do you do? No, that was it. I mean, that was it. And then we we started getting response pretty quickly or things that were in motion already now accelerated to help kind of break the log jam and get sailors where they needed to be to quarantine and get mm-hmm. sailors into these. I mean, there are 10,000 vacant rooms in Guam at this point because there is no tourist traffic, right? And hotels that rely on money and, and, and funding and revenue. 
So we knew they were available, which is one of the reasons we were pushing for, hey, I don't care how you solve this. Here's a suggestion. You have hotels available. Let's use them. Let's let's solve the political issue of getting sailors outside the base, and let's use these. So so all that stuff accelerated. Now, some was probably already in motion. Some maybe was going to be was slow. I, I knew the email, I think, would probably help that. And I think it did in the end kind of mm-hmm. speed things up. Um, and so, I, you know, shortly thereafter, it again, this is the risk, um, it, but it got out. And was someone sent, sent it on or someone sent it to the media or somebody took a snapshot, sent it to the media, and I think the news got wind of it. And then... And then, you know, and then they, they held then the military leadership accountable to say, what are you going to do? You know what? You have a captain of the ship that's concerned. What are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Um, and initially, again, initially the, the Navy was very supportive, um, meaning that this is what we, can, we want captain ships to do. We want them to stand up when there's a problem and speak truth to power. Um, you know, and I, I felt like at that point that, yeah, you know, I may only make admiral, but, you know, I feel I'll feel good about um, what happened because it got the action I, I needed and mm-hmm. wanted. Um, and then short circuit that, the, the acting sector of the Navy at the time just was frustrated, I think, with that whole thing and the extra pressure the press brought on the, the, the current administration and himself. And, um, again, the world's focused on trying to solve this problem. So if you're in a leadership position, you're going to get spears from everywhere. And I, no doubt the administration at the time was suffering from that. And he was part of that. He's a political appointee. Mm-hmm. He took it upon himself then to relieve me of command, like a couple of days after the email. Um, and so. That so be- that's a decision at his level yeah. that he's now passing downstream to yeah. your chain of command. Yeah. And so, okay, so what's who, who's telling you that now? Is that coming via email or who's? So the admiral, you? admiral called me down and very cordially and very you know empathetically said, "Hey, you know, Chopper, I've you know been directed by the, the acting secretary of the Navy to relieve you of the Roseau, and you'll need, you know you should get off, you need to get off the ship today if you can and work a plan with the XO and stuff." Wow. Uh, so I said, "Okay, we'll work that out." Thanks, yeah. sir. And again, he was. To his credit, he was very professional, uh, as he did the entire time. He was, um, you know, wasn't angry, wasn't frustrated. He was, you know, in my mind, I think I said I, to some extent of, I'm sure I'll have questions later, sir, but I get it. I mean, that's how this works. Yeah. Um, how does that get out to the crew? Because there's some pretty, uh, famous video yeah. of you leaving the ship. And I don't know if it was then or later that acting secretary of the Navy is going to arrive. I'd like to get to that too, but yeah, but what, how does this, how does this get out? I mean, we all know word spreads pretty quickly pretty on the quick. ship, but yeah, pretty quick. I mean, one, I have to pack, uh, two, I have to get my stuff so I can mm-hmm. get off three. We have to have a plan of what I'm going to do, where I'm going to yeah. go. So people are involved in that and they're going to tell yeah, their buddies. Yeah. So, I mean, it takes you a long time. Like, I, what I didn't want to leave, leave all my stuff and then say, Hey, someone pack it up. And yeah, send of course. It to me. So I spent some time that day packing. And then by the time they had arranged where I was going to stay, um, on, in Guam, oh, you know, I had all the stuff packed and it was time to leave the ship. So, um, I think I, you know, I talked with the command match chief and the, and the CEO and I said, Hey, I'm ready to go. Uh, I could use some help with like, you know, my bags. So sure. sure well, yeah. Um, and they were again, very, everyone was very supportive. Everyone was coming as I'm packing, people are coming by to take pictures or say thanks and stuff. And that kind of been the attitude from the crew. The moment, the moment the email went out, the crew was aware. Um, again, that's just how things spread out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's okay. I mean, I think in anything they knew that that point they felt relieved. They felt like, okay, this plight we're under, we're suffering from COVID. Not, no one really knows anything about it. They don't feel like the Navy's taking action. Um, and now they felt like, okay, at least our, at least people are aware of our problem right? we have yeah. right now. And so I got a lot of support for that, I guess. And so, yeah, so when it came time to leave, I think I was going to go down the initially, um, normally you leave the ship from the officer's brow. As you know, there's the officer's brow for the chiefs and the officers. It's more ceremonial. And then you have the, what we call the enlisted brow. Mm-hmm. And that time, by the time I was ready to leave, the officer brow was closed, uh, cause we closed it at night to save on watch requirements and you don't need it. And we were stuck pier side. And then the, the CDO came up and said, Hey, sir, you know, the listed or the officer brows closed. We'll open it for you. And then we'll take you that way. And I'm like, just, I said, don't open it for me. I said, it's fine. Yeah. I said, I'll just go to the enlisted brow. I said, I'm very comfortable with that. And you know, it's probably, it's a fitting, a fitting way to leave ship. But obviously word had spread. I was getting ready to leave. So by the time, literally at that, from the time I leave the import cabin down to the, the, the hangar deck to then leave the ship, you know, most of the, the, the remaining three or 4,000 on the ship had become aware and come out to say goodbye. And give me a send off. And, 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 you know, I look at it many ways, right? It was not expected. You know, there's ever a moment where I thought I was going to tear up. It was probably leaving the ship with that kind of support. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, you know, part of me felt bad. I mean, we can always say that there's, you know, there's no cause worth dying for that's not better than, you know, to live for to fight another day. In my mind, my, my concern was I'm leaving the crew behind. Like, you know, we've talked about being ready for the fight and here I am leaving when it really matters. And I, you know, I knew they were going to be in good hands, but well, I felt it wasn't bad. by your choice. Yeah, but you still feel bad, right? Yeah, and in sure. my mind, I'm like, um, 
knowing they're going to be in good hands. So in, in many ways, right, I, I looked at the farewell as it's well, not forgiveness is the right word, but it was a way of saying, hey. Vindication, yeah. maybe? No, I don't, not no. even that. It was just more, it's more we understand, sir. Like we get it, you okay. know, we're going to fight on in your yeah. honor, right, kind of thing. And I felt, so I, that's how I took that, you know, and, and a little forgiveness, like, yeah, you can leave, sir, but we got your back. We're going to take yeah. care of this. Um, and so, yeah, so I left the ship. And then I, of course, had tested positive for COVID like like an hour before I left the ship. So I may maintain my distance as I headed out. And then I um, sat in Guam for a month after that and, and quarantine yeah. before I could fly back to a much different world. <laughs> the commander or the person in charge of almost anything can be thought of as like, you know, the old man or, you know, the. I guess what I'm getting at here or at least wanting to ask you is how was your relationship with the crew prior to that? Was it easy for them to rally around you because in their minds you had done something for them and it didn't work out? So now they love you yeah. or were you pretty well regarded before that? I realize I'm asking you to talk about yeah. how other people yeah, felt, yeah. but, you know, I mean, I, I'd like to think I made it, you know, I, I inherited a great ship from Los, um, and, and he came in actually after I was relieved shortly he came after back. he came back and, and took back over. Um, mm -hmm. I like to think I brought a, you know, I helped improve, not improve, right? We're probably continue the positive culture that had been built um, mm -hmm. under his watch. And, and, you know, my priorities every day were the sailors. You know, you know, I, I remember learning early on on my first tour in HSL 37, you know, from my first chief I ever worked for. He's like, sir, you got three priorities. Your first priority, take care of your sailors. Your second priority, take care of your sailors. Your third priority, take care of your sailors. So that was my ingrained in me and my DNA as a young lieutenant in HSL 37 all the way now to captain of the ship. I never forgot those words. Mm. And that's how I try to lead, I think, every day. I try to make decisions based on not not to coddle anybody. I mean, we're not a business of coddling people. It's about what do you do to make their job easy so they can be the best they can be at their job? And how do you show them respect and, and, and be, you know, and and give them the support they need? That That was my... And it still is my understanding of being a good leader. You're, you're there to take care of them. You're there to do all you can to make their jobs easier so they can do a great job. Yeah. Um, and I never, I guess I try to never forget that. And I try to instill that, you know, in the culture when I got there as the captain. And, yeah. and I think they, and they were excited about deployments. Like, you know, I'm hearing a ship at the start of the season, right? And so they've been through all the hard parts of workups. And, um, but I, you know, I, that was kind of my style as the XO is, of the, the Reagan as the CEO of the Blue Ridge as the yeah. CEO of the, um, you know, BFA 94. Sure. Arguably, the most effective leaders will remove the obstacles and set the conditions for everyone yeah. following to do their jobs and do it well, yeah. because you can't do all those jobs. You can just set the conditions. Right. Now, I won't ask you necessarily, although I guess I'm about to, to opine on what's happening in the White House. But, you know, the president's mentioning your name. Yeah. The secretary, acting secretary of the Navy himself flies halfway around yeah. the world. Any idea later if, if you were privy to or the decisions? I mean, this guy made the decision to fire you. Yeah. Then sounds like it has to maybe justify it by flying out there. I mean, to me, as an outsider looking in, knowing that White House, I feel like he was trying to impress his boss. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean I can't I don't I can't speak to what took place there. I think, you know, in his in his mind, I give him credit, you know, I said this I think in the beginning, we all wanted the same thing. Like you know, we wanted what was best for the Navy, what was best for the crew. No one wanted to lose any sailors. Um you know, I, I knew though that was my number one priority and no one was going to want to take care of the sailors more than I did. So I was going to do all I could. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's got challenges, like you said, administrative challenges, you know, the administration challenges and, and dealing with the press at a level that I never had to deal with, um, at the time at least. Um, and so I think in his, you know, he came out, um, the acting secretary of Navy came out to try to, to try to not just, not just damage control, but he wanted to just tell the sailors he understood what was going on. And I think, you know, there's many stories of what happened, but I think he ended up getting frustrated and he felt like he was, um, you know, being second guessed, which he was. He was being second best by a crew that obviously, you know, I had bonded with in my time on board. And he was kind of stepping into the lion's den a little bit. And I think, you know, I think he probably regrets the decision or not the decision to go out there, but maybe what he said. And, and that's and that's fair. And, um, you know, I had a chance to talk to him in Guam. He stopped by when I was uh, in, in, in quarantine in Guam waiting to fly back. And, and he stopped by to, and we chatted for a little bit uh, after I'd been relieved and. And it was very cordial. Um, was it? Yeah. And he said, hey, nothing about this is personal. And I said, I, you know, you know, I don't take it personally. I mean, we're all trying to do a job and I did what I thought was the right thing to do. And, you know, as, as did you, sir. And I think that, you know, in the end, we'll, we'll have to live with that. But, um, but I, but I said, I appreciate that, you know, you understand that this is not a personal thing. Um, he was concerned with things like the press and I can only imagine the pressure he was under at that point from both the administration and the press. And, and obviously he flew back like the next day and, and then, and then resigned based on the fact that the comments he did make on the ship had gotten out ironically. And, um, and they were not, you know, they just weren't, I don't think that's what he intended to say. I just think that he, 
emotion got the best of him. And I think that's probably what he regrets is the fact that those, you know, what he said was, I don't necessarily think what he believed. I think he was frustrated and, uh, and it was a challenging situation and it came across like he was throwing me under the bus, which is clearly not probably the tactic he was really wanted to take in front mm-hmm. of the crew that had just kind of gave me a send off. So indeed. You spend some time in Guam. Obviously, we could spend time talking about the next weeks and months, but ultimately you find yourself back in San Diego. And now there's some discussion about, well, wait a minute. This gentleman who, who fired you basically yeah. was forced to resign because of the perceived poor decisions he made. Well, then does his firing count? And they didn't, yeah. he didn't check with really the CNO or anyone in your chain yeah. of command. He sort of acted unilaterally. So now there's some discussion about, well, wait a minute. Uh, and I, you weren't the first yeah. carrier CO to ever be relieved. Right. A lot of them were for poor decisions or poor relationships or other things. Um, but now there's some scuttlebutt, as we would say in the Navy, about, well, maybe he could be reinstated. Yeah. What, where did that, where did you first start catching wind of that? When the CNO's office called me and said, we're, we intend to look at putting you back in command. How long after was that? Um, probably, Probably two weeks after I'd left. You know, a week oh, wow. after week after the Secretary of the Navy had, had um, resigned okay. and then um shortly thereafter that. And and they you know, it was not a guarantee. They just said, Hey, we are looking at um we're gonna recommend is what they said to, to reinstate you based on our initial understanding of the situation and what we think is best for the crew and the navy. Who's that recommendation going to? So it's gonna be the CNO ultimately who's gonna But his office okay, so his yeah. the folks, his staff are going to recommend that to their boss, the CNO, who's then yeah. going to tell what a new acting secretary or the president. So himself? he's got to get then approval. He's going to go through uh, the new acting secretary of the Navy as well as then the secretary of defense. Okay. Um, and so the CNO intended to do that. In fact, I was I got to the point where I had written a uh, a letter that I was going to be that was going to be released. My my only public statement, uh, essentially, in the, throughout the whole thing, to say essentially. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity to come back in command and continue the fight and help out. And I appreciate the Navy's willingness to put me, trust me back in command. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, that had been written. I was ready. And then the intent was they were going to brief the secretary of defense like that week. And, uh, and, and I think that the answer they got was not so fast. Let's, let's slow this down a little bit, you know, because now again, imagine it's beyond just naval history. It's beyond, you know, cause it would have been the first CEO ever reinstated, uh, that had been previously relieved. And there was still a lot of stuff going on above that level to include, you know, the, exe- the full executive branch and, and all the pressure they were under. So, yeah, it, it you know, it would have been a tough decision. I mean, I was, I was, you know, heartened that maybe they were considering it to the point where the CNO was going to go on my behalf and recommend that. Uh, but I knew it would never be that easy. I knew that from then on I'd be under a microscope for good or bad for right. the duration of my tour. Um, I was okay with that. I mean, I was excited, obviously, the opportunity to go back. I won't deny it. It was, like you said, it was the pinnacle of a career. I was flying helicopters. I was flying fighters. I was, you know, spending time on the bridge and it was great. It was a great job. Um, no better job than I've ever had. So I was excited with the opportunity to go back, but I also knew it would not be just a smooth sailing, like welcome back and people would forget about everything. So, Pick up where you left so I think when they had those conversations at the time with Secretary of Defense and, and others that were maybe brought in the conversation, they were probably like, let's slow down. Let's do another investigation because they'd already done one, which is how they reached that conclusion. Let's do another more comprehensive investigation and then we can stand on that or not. Um, I, when I got the call later that week that said, Hey, we're not going to do it as quickly as we thought. We're going to do another investigation. I think in my mind at that point, I said, all right, chances now are not really good. Mm. And in fact, the longer you delay it, the less likely it makes sense. Like you don't, you know, it'd be weird to go back to the ship two months later. Um, and so at that point I started as we go, eventually approached the end of the investigation later on in June, two or three months later, you know, at that point I, I'd held out hope because I think there was still, uh, a lot of folks that had believed it was going to go in my favor and they were going to put me back in command. But then I got the call that day that wasn't going to happen. So and that was back. That was in June. So then I knew, okay, now, you know, now there's no longer a chance. Um, and I, I certainly got hopeful because I was excited to go back and yeah. bring him back from deployment. And, well, you, know, you had indications. Uh, and I, yeah. And I had indications. I, you know, press was calling me, Hey, we heard you're going to go back in command. What do you have to say? And so, yeah, I got, I got hopeful, but, sure. um, but you know, in the end, again, I, I think, I remember getting the call and being told from the the vice chief of naval operations, and he said, "Hey, Chopper, we looked at it again, and we looked at the investigation, and we made the decision that we're not going to reinstate you." I said, "Okay." I you know I said, "Sir, thanks. I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys taking a look at it. I appreciate the consideration, uh, and let me know. You know, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll figure out what I'm gonna do next." And then they quietly release that on a Friday afternoon when you try to bury things that yeah. you don't talk about over the weekends, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's okay. I think you know. I say that. 
things, everything happens for a reason. Um, I was there, uh, at the, in the air boss's office when I got the call and he's like, what? Well, I want you to work for me. You know, you want to stay here in San Diego and, and you can keep flying. And I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Love that. So, so I was able to go from that and then, uh, spend time mm-hmm. now on the staff and a really good job, you know, running, you know, the entire master schedule and, and all the training budget, you know, I had a eight million or eight billion dollar budget for parts and fuel and training. And, um, I had a huge, great team of just experts from all our communities. And I yeah. did that for about two years and, and kept flying. I kept going for more. I drive up there for one week a month and then fly with VFA 122 and, and other squadrons and had a good time. So yeah, I, I was like hard to, hard to really complain. I mean, I knew I, I missed the job. I would say I missed the crew. Right. Um, but I felt like, Throughout the entire process, naval aviation always had my back, and um, you know, and they were there to the end. I mean, to reach out to my family and support. My oldest son was an air crewman at the time, and they reached out to him. I mean, they were tremendously supportive. We lived on the base there in North Island uh, throughout the whole COVID debacle when I got back. But um, yeah, but it was, but they were very supportive. And and you know, when I retired almost a year ago, you know, last month on the Midway, uh, it was you know on the Midway full of folks from naval aviation and the air boss was up there with me. And I just, you know, I felt again, just felt like they had my back the whole time. It was, a, it was a good family to be part of for 30 years in naval aviation. So. Very cool. All right. Well, I want to move into a section where I have some listener questions, if okay. that's okay. Yeah. So this is uh, on some leadership. It's on the event we just discussed. It's all over the map. And these are from folks that support the fighter pilot podcast financially on the service called Patreon. Yeah. I tell them, Hey, I'm going to sit down with my good buddy chopper. Uh, here are the questions that you can ask about, right? Cause I don't want them asking about uh, personal stuff. And so they usually come up with great questions and Derek Chung, who I believe is Wang. I think he's been on the show. If that's Wang, I don't know if he's supporting yeah. the show or not, but I think so. Anyway, he said you had to command and lead during an unprecedented and unpredictable crisis, as well as it all playing out publicly. What are the lessons learned from that experience in quotes and any advice you give to current and future leaders, which speaking of that, as we'll get to what you're currently in future doing is yeah. you're doing some speaking so yeah you probably have this pretty well thought out um yeah i mean it's nothing's black and white i mean my recommendations through all this and and what i learned or what was reinforced to the mm-hmm. whole theodore roosevelt episode you know if you're making decisions for what you believe to be the right reasons and for the right you know meaning that you're not making them for your own personal well-being you're not making them for financial reasons you're making them for people that you've been entrusted to take care of they might not be perfect i mean you're not going to always make perfect decisions and, and you can't let you know, great be the, the enemy of good, right? As they say. So you make the best decision you can with the information you have for the right reasons. And if you do that, um, I guarantee that you'll be okay no matter how it goes, even if people disagree with you. And you're always going to have people when you get more senior, better what you're doing, whether it's corporate, nonprofit or military, there's always going to be people that second guess or question your decision. But, but if you make them for, for those reasons, for the right reasons, um, for selfless reasons, you'll be okay. Like in the end, you can, st- you can stand tall and, and might regret the outcome of what happened to you personally, but you'll never regret the fact that when you had the opportunity, you stood up for what you believe in. Um, Very good. Niels Hansen is also a supporter. He's an Air army officer. He says, are there any decisions you made during command of the Theodore Roosevelt you would change now? Um, I got a one wire, like one of my last traps, so I should have had <laughs> that, that's, power. That's not, well, about. that is a decision, I guess. Yeah, you decided I, I to. I took off power. I was high power. and close and flew through. And, yeah, no. <laughs> that's um, the jello on arrival. Yes. Um, no, I mean, I think, you know, I think I touched on a little bit. I think if we're talking specifically about COVID on the TR, um, sure. you know, I think, you know, I, it would, like I said, it was never made in a vacuum. There was plenty of folks that we, we talked with through the whole process and our analysis, of the situation and, and what we thought would, what we needed to go to move forward. Um, you know, I mentioned, you know, the admiral on board who I, who is, who I'm a, you know, tremendous fan of who got wrapped up in the subsequent investigation as well and then and retired. But, but a great guy. And I think that, you know, um, I wish I'd maybe given him one more opportunity to, 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 to help to make that last kind of ditch red flare before I felt that. Cause I didn't, I didn't, wasn't trying to take away his authority either, but I knew again, ultimately mm. I was ultimately accountable. And, and my decision at the time was, I think I, I stand by it, but I think maybe there's one opportunity, one more opportunity to talk to him about it um, and, and get a flare. Maybe you're, I don't know. Oh, that's a good answer. But I think uh, other than that, the one wire still bothers me, but it wasn't my last trap. It was, Your last trap was a one no, wire? No, kidding. It was oh. okay. Three. Underline. Of course. Was every, when you, but, but yeah, let's go back to that. Yeah. As the, uh, as the CO coming across, was every pass an okay or were no, they green? Oh no. Oh no? no. Okay. Yeah, they're, I mean, you they're stand green up. And legit. 
you still stand up and <laughs> you think paddles must all over and they, they call it like they see it. I mean, that's what I think is remarkable about our business. And it doesn't matter if you're it's the right. captain of the ship, the size where you're pulling in or what port call. Um, I mean, it's about, you know, safety and consistency. And, and so they, you know, they were, they probably enjoyed telling me when I had a long <laughs> wire, but, um, but you know, it was fun. I don't think I ever, I get, I think they made fun of me at Follies, but not for my passes. Oh, well, they need a target at Follies. Yeah. Absolutely. But they were good. Yeah, it was good. Tom Oates says, how is the increasingly polarized and intensity, intensely, excuse me, partisan political landscape of DC politics affecting military naval leadership in the field? Let me put a asterisk on that. Would you say what happened to you is the new standard mm. or was that sort of part of the executive branch at the time, which I've been kind of subtly poking some jabs yeah. at here. But yeah. um, I mean, it, again, from the outside looking in, it seemed to me like that particular person very much wanted to impress by being decisive, let's say his yeah. boss and then not to be the acting anymore, but the actual, of course that right. didn't quite work out, but is that, was that, had you seen other instances of that before this very public situation or, you know, or, I mean, you know, you could just go back through those years of that administration and know that there, um, you know, there were more influence from the executive branch than we'd seen previously. And I, yeah. and I say it because one of the friction points for us with COVID was that at the time we were reporting everything to the executive branch. Um, and that, and that was all COVID numbers across the entire military and, and DOD and civilian, uh, government. And so you can imagine then if everything has to go to say the vice president, for awareness and decision. It's going to take a long time until right. decisions are made. And that was kind of the friction that I felt in the fog of war that I was talking about that, you know, if that's, and that was, you know, as we were informed that everything goes through the, the white house and the vice president for vetting before it's released publicly. I'm like, well, man, it's only going to take about a month for people to become aware of this. Um, so that was part of my calculus when I was concerned with that and how I tried to shoot the red flare. But, but I also think, you know, it's question is, is it hyper partisan or are we just more hyper aware? Yeah. And, you know, you go back 10 years ago, we didn't all have, all the media stuff we have now available at our fingertips all the time, which means we're much more aware, for good or bad. I mean, and it's not filtered. It's just awareness, That's whether right. it's accurate or not, to be determined. So so I do think it's maybe more of a new norm, and I don't, I won't put any focus on that one administration or the other. I think that's maybe where, where we're at. Just, um, you know, if you're, a, if you're a fan of history, obviously, you know, I think Mark Twain says, right, like, let, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes a lot, you know, and you can go back in not too distant past. And you can see we had similar type of hyperpartisan, you know, politics. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite books for those that want to read about non-aviation stuff is Six Frigates. And it talks about when we built our, our first frigates back in, you know, 200 years ago and the politics involved on, you know, where the frigates were going to be built and which states got to provide the wood. And it's, and so you could make parallels to the F-35 program in the mm -hmm. U.S. And, and so it's been doing that for, we've been doing that for 200 years and we used to duel, right? I mean, there used to be areas in the in Washington D.C. where you could do have a duel if you disagreed with a your fellow you know politician. So so I think we've always had this political kind of back and forth. Maybe we're just more hyper aware of it now. Um, you know, and, and I'll tell you though, you know, when I was um, in the Navy, I never voted for a federal election. Um, really? And I, you know, and there's others that haven't as well. I just chose, I, I felt like my role in the military was to be as you know uh, nonpartisan as possible and and just do what I was supposed to do to support the constitution. That was my loyalty, you know, loyalty, so to speak. And, and so I never did until, and, you know, and really there hasn't been an election since I retired. So I guess the next election will be my first chance to vote. I mean, I might've voted locally. And for me, I think that's kind of how I would, most senior officers in the military should look at it. I'm not saying they shouldn't vote. That's, that's a personal decision, but mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter who the president is. You're going to have to do what you've been doing and you're going to follow your orders you've been given as long as they make sense. And you're also going to, you know, support and defend the constitution. That's our oath, right? As officers. Right. So uh, I think that's important to remind people, but um, yeah, I mean, I think at the time the president made the comment I always remember um, is he made the comment and he can, he said, you know, what is, what does the captain think that he's Hemingway? Which my first thought was, I hope my high school English teacher hears this because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was never the thought he had when I was writing papers, you know, many years ago. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, but obviously, it made it, it made it to that level and got yeah, some attention. It did. Ofer Haran says, what advice can you give to a leader or manager who is in strong disagreement with higher level but still has to face and lead the men, especially the closest other leaders, XO and staff, who know you so well and your way of thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you, don't be something you're not. Don't try to 
people know you're going to know you well enough to know if you agree or disagree. I, if you disagree, the question, you know, you should never disagree publicly. Mm-hmm. You know, if I disagree with my boss, I would never say then publicly to my peers or subordinates that I disagree. Because now, to be honest, you're undercutting your own authority, right? If I say I'm only, we're only doing this because the admiral says to do this, they're going to come back and go, well, then you're just a puppet, right? You're just, so I think you have to own it and then you do all you can to try to influence a decision before it's made. But once the decision is made, as long as it's legal, ethical, as long as it's not going to put people at risk, you know, you know, particularly in a peacetime environment, which mm-hmm. is where all this stuff with the TR unfolded, um, then you're going to support it. In my case, you know, if you could tie it back to the TR, you know, we were not at war. The risk should have been low across the board. It's not that I disagreed with the decisions. I just didn't think we were making decisions as quickly as I wanted them to be made to, to try to stem that exponential growth of COVID cases and the potential risk of my crew. And that's, that's probably what really drove it. And, and did I disagree on this expediency? Yeah, of course I did. And that's kind of why in the end I felt obligated to take a stand because I didn't feel like anybody else, you know, yeah. above me understood that as well. And so let me play the other side of this because I agree with you that we yeah. were not at war. I think you could also make a very strong case for that particular region where you were yeah. acting with that national authority to make our neighbors yeah. aware of what, you know, hey, we're here and we're serious. I think people might have taken issue with that. And I remember yeah. seeing some various uh, editorials about, yeah. oh, yeah, we agree. Oh, no, I don't agree because it's the South China Sea. Right. So, well, I mean, I think it comes down to risk mitigation. When, when you're at war, as a leader, you're going to make decisions. And you might be making decisions like, do I lose one ship or do I lose two ships or whatever the case might be? Ideally, it's zero. There's a different calculus. When you're at peacetime, um, you know, I, I didn't sign up to serve for 30 years to die in peacetime. I knew that was a possibility in our line of work, high risk. But now that I have, you know, I've had sons in the military or in the military, you know, I, I pray we don't make a stupid decision and put put them at risk uh, during a peacetime thing. And I was saying I want them extra risk in wartime, but that's just the nature when you go to conflict. Yeah. So I think you have to you have to distinguish between the two. I think there are I think it's important to say whether you're in peace or wartime and we can say all we want about South China Sea. We can talk about the rhetoric that we're using to try to influence decisions. But to say we're at war is wrong, in my opinion. Um because I'm not going to make decisions and I don't think leadership makes decisions to take unnecessary risk that you would otherwise take in wartime. And I'm not talking World War II risk where you're going to lose ships and carriers all you know, you could even go to OIF and oh yeah, I mean, we didn't accept risk at all or minimal risk in wartime right. at all possible. So why would we accept it in peacetime in an organization where you have to wear a cranial if you're stepping three feet above the deck because we're worried about you falling at your head or you have to wear a reflective belt if it's even if it's light out when you're running outside the you know outside the gate or something even though the sun's shining because we have to follow <laughs> rules. So we, we mitigate risk so many in so many ways across yeah. the military. Um, at least, you know, that was my perspective and obviously why I took the tack and I would argue, I would gladly argue with anyone that says we're, we're at war right now and, and we should accept the risk we would at wartime. Cause yeah. when you're at war, you accept a different kind of risk. Take a D day. Yeah. We're going to send yeah. waves <laughs> and waves of our young men ashore until someone breaks yeah. through. That's crazy. Yeah. And you could go back to when I was in Japan on the Blue Ridge, um, we had the Fitzgerald and McCain incident and we lost mm-hmm. 17 sailors through two collisions in a peacetime environment. And the impact that had on the Navy and the and how we had to answer to the world at large, the readiness state we really were in, yeah. and that's going to happen. Uh, and it's tragic. And so, in, you know, one of the things I thought about through all my stuff with the TR is we can't have another thing. We can't lose 10 sailors to COVID after just losing 17 sailors for, you know, collisions at sea. I mean, we, we owe it to these sailors. I mean, they are a strength of what we do, and we yeah. owe it to them to protect them uh, as much as possible. And, and I, I was trying to avoid what I saw was a potential another PR disaster if you lose 10 sailors for COVID, and at least wasn't going to happen on my lunch. Marcus Rosenwald says, Captain Crozier might be the highest officer in charge of the ship at the time, but what about his staff like EXO and others? Is it common to discuss such decisions or solely the problem of the captain? And I think you've already answered this, is you had folks around you that were trusted confidants that... Yeah, I, I mean, it's not a democracy, but I don't think I ever made any big decisions without getting input from my sure. entire staff. You know, to run a ship of 5,000... The crew, crew of which is 3,000, the air wings 2,000, you have all your heads of department mm-hmm. um, and they're experts in their field, yeah. reactor officer, supply officer, engineer. Um, and you can't, you can't, I don't know enough about any of those things to be the expert to make a decision. So I get their advice and we make decisions, you know, based on trust and timing and try to coordinate amongst all the departments. Um, so I never, I never made a decision other than, you know, whether I add or subtract power coming over the ramp um, by myself, everything else. And even paddles would weigh in on that at times, That's right? True. So you generally, it went all possible. You're just going to make better decisions when you do it collectively. But ultimately, you know, 
the buck stops with me and, and you're going to make a decision. You have to own it when you're done. That's right. Jevin says you previously talked about how the TR would be able to fight on despite COVID-19 if it needed to. Seeing as how we may well face another pandemic in the future, I hope not, Jevin. Uh, could you expand yeah. on that? And, and I guess I would say that obviously we don't talk specifics on yeah. tactics, but it would be a little out of place to do that here anyway, even if we could. But just big picture, right? I mean, again, it's risk. It's risk. So yeah. are we either, you know... Yeah, I mean, that was, and I guess that was my point. And if you someone goes back and reads the email, I mean, I was specific about that. That if um, you know, if if needed, we would man the ship and we'd go and fight. And the, the key being that what's the risk level, right? If we're at war, if the balloon goes up and we're going to go in combat, we would have manned the ship and we would have gone away and we accepted the risk. We, you know, maybe we lose ten, twenty, fifty, hundred. Doesn't matter. I mean, we're going into an environment where we're, those are the numbers you're talking about. Ideally, it's still zero, but. Make no mistake about it. If we go to war with China, you will lose people. Oh, yeah. Not by the ones and twos or the dozens. You're probably talking hundreds and thousands. That's the nature of the conflict we're talking about. So that's – when we say war, that's where I think. That's what we train to, right? That's what you and I spent our entire careers training to. You know, presence, port calls, show of force, that is not war. That is that is prepping the battle space, and that is that means the risk, in my opinion, should be low. There's still risk. If you wanted zero risk, you never take off. You never get the ship underway. You never take a reactor critical. I mean, but, you know – in our, in our era, what we're doing right now is all kind of just posturing, as it were. We're yeah. not we're not in combat, and we're not willing to take those risks. As a society, we embrace risk all day long. I do in my airline capacity, but it's yeah. all mitigated or reduced by these strategies we have, whether it's checklists or procedures or certain things we say in a certain order, and it's yeah. the same thing in, in combat. So. Yeah. Uh, Michael Dukak says, uh, did you feel any support from other CVNCOs after that? So... Yeah, I mean, I, I actually got a lot of supportive emails um, yeah. for the three, you know, the three or four days I was on the ship until I left, and then at that point I didn't have access to that email account anymore. Um, I, did, I mean, I probably got dozens and dozens of emails, and, and some were some were like, "Hey, thank you for bringing this to attention because we've been fighting the same battle, but you know, I didn't wasn't getting support." And others were, "Hey, holy cow, thanks for the heads up. We're going to deal with this differently now because we weren't tracking the potential risk, and we're going to start thinking about it." So I like to think that, um, you know. I mean, the route is anyone's going to email me is going to be positive, right? They're not going to generally email me if they know my email and, and say something disparaging. But so they were all very supportive um, mm-hmm. across the board and, and for many reasons, right? From a tactical level on, hey, thanks for bringing awareness to it and bringing, you know, letting us think about how to deal with this to just general support because I've known them, flown with them, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I felt pretty supported internally. All right, let's change gears a little bit and get to some more lighthearted stuff. Nick Brown says, if you could fly any tactical aircraft you've never flown before, and you've flown a lot, uh, what would it be and why? Um, any tactical aircraft. Any this tactical could be Air Force aircraft. too, no, or I, foreign maybe. So I, when I was when I so this goes back to the helicopter story because the first book I ever read was called Chicken Hawk and it was about Vietnam. I love that movies. book. Yeah, and and I remember reading that on vacation and that's why again it goes back to why I really enjoy flying helicopters. But I think if I could pick one tactical aircraft to fly, it'd be the A six. Um, really, I like. I mean, I just like that mission of F eighteen stuff more than anything. Is the and the strike fighter role, I was always just, I liked the strike portion of it more. Um, and I like the idea of flying low. I like the idea of having a, uh, you know, being next to you. And, and, you know, that's, I come to, came to enjoy that a lot in the, in the Super Hornet with a whizzo in the back. And yeah. I found that uh, enjoyable to fly and get to talk about things and support one another and made my job easier when I was a captain flying a Super Hornet after so many years. So, um, but I thought the A6 would, you know, the A6 would be similar and, and the mission was great and they carried a lot of ordnance and, um, yeah, that would be my choice. You'd have the jet like the Super Hornet, but you'd have the side-by-side seating like the helicopter. It's the best of both yeah, worlds. Perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. There you go. Fantastic. All right, speaking of helicopters, George Bravo, call sign Hueso, says, did you ever have a moment in rotary wing training before the hover skill clicked that you thought, I'll never be able to do this? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question. Because when I read Chicken Hawk and then fast forward and I'm in flight school learning to fly helicopters, mm-hmm. I was convinced. I had spent so much time thinking about how to hover that I was going to pick it up the first time. Like I was just going to be this wonder kid and there, and, and every instructor will tell you that's never going to happen. It's going to take you five to six flights, you know, maybe seven or eight. I'm like there's no way I've read about it. I've studied this, this one aspect of helicopter flying. I knew I could do. And so then you get in your, your first flight in a helicopter and it starts with, you know, okay, Hey, you get to, for the next five minutes, you've got the collective and the instructor's got the pedals and he's got the, uh, and the stick. Right. Um, and then after that, he goes, okay, switch. And now you got cyclic. And then, you know, so you're switching around. You're only doing one at a time. And each one by itself, 
was was pretty reasonable. I, th- I mean, there was, you're going to move around a little bit, but you felt like I can control this. And then he goes, "Okay, you got all three. And then you jump on, and you're like, and it, it takes about a nanosecond to go from "I got this" to "Oh my god, I'm going to crash this thing." <laughs> and you're like, "That doesn't make any sense. Like, how am I going to do this for the rest of my career?" Yeah. And, and then you do that every flight, and at some at some point. Um, you're not thinking about what to do with your hands and your feet. Because remember, everything is being used, right? And and your scan starts picking up movement quicker than you've ever thought possible. And you start seeing things through the, you know, the kick screen and stuff. And you're able to pick up movement and you're picking up, you know. And so you just – and suddenly – and it was. It was like the sixth flight. It was like, oh, I kind of got this. I mean, it's not perfect, but you're – Sure. Yeah. And you're, and then you think about it and it all goes to, <laughs> to you know, hand basket. But, um, yeah. but then And then once you – the reality is once you figure that out, it is like riding a bike. And, you know, I jumped in I, a year ago. I did my, my last helicopter flight and my last flight in the Super Hornet there in the moor. And, and I remember, you know, I had it been, at that point, it had been two years on my last helicopter flight on the ship. And my, my helicopter flight on the ship, you know, maybe one flight in the last 20 years. So it had been this big gap. And I did my, my last flight about a year ago. On the first day, I flew in a, in a SAR H60 up out of the moor. And, and we're taxiing. He's like, okay, you got it. And I'm in my mind, I'm like, you know, I really have only, I'm not, I'm definitely not proficient. I've only f- hovered maybe a total of 10 minutes in the last 20 years kind of thing. And, uh, but it just comes right back and we flew up to the mountains and landed at 10,000 feet. And then the next day I flew in a, in the back of a super hornet for my last instructor flight for the kids first fam one. And then on my last flight, I flew in a, uh, a black night jet, a VFA 154, uh, gave me one of their beautiful aircraft and then flew in the Buzz Peterson with my wingman. And we flew up the barrier around the Golden Gate and came back. It was pretty neat. Flight schedules always put our last names. So if you and I were flying together over Iraq, it would say ILO Crozier. Uh, and if it's a two plane air, two seat airplane, it might say ILO slash Crozier if you were in my back seat. Was there a time I think I heard where that said Crozier slash yeah. Crozier? Yeah, there happened to be a time when I was in the moor and one of my one week instructor jaunts, um, you know, after I'd left the TR and I was uh, doing staff work here at North Island and, and my middle son was up there in the moor for his midshipman training and flying with a VFA 122. So I was very careful not, I didn't want to pressure anybody. I, in fact, I would have been okay if it didn't work out, but, mm-hmm. um, they got wind of that and they were VFA 122 were, were, took pretty good care of me, uh, all, you know, through my syllabus and even after the TR and, and, so yeah, the next day I showed up and there was Crozier Crozier and I was able to fly Sean, Sean's very first tactical flight in a VFA 122 Super Hornet T Bird. So we had a stick in the back. Nice. And, uh, yeah, we took off and over the Sierras, gave him controls and let him fly. And we did low level and we did aerobatics and came back and he felt great. That and, must have uh, been a proud moment for dad. Picture. And, and, and yeah, and Mary yeah. was excited that yeah. Yeah, she wanted desperately to hear how it went as soon yeah. as we landed because she was. <laughs> Because you are, after all, riding on ejection seats. We are on uh, ejection seats. And, yeah. <laughs> Last question brings us back around to the beginning. Bethany Atchison says, other than the obvious technical differences, in what ways did you need to retrain your brain from rotary to fighter jet to develop the instinct pilots need to fly well? You talked about landing with your feet on the rotor pedals and, or the brakes. And brakes. That didn't go too well. <laughs> Was there anything else to Bethany's point? No, I mean, you know, in single seat, you know, we like to say alone and unafraid and you're, you know, that means you can make mistakes and no one knows about it really in most cases. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I really learned the value of having another pilot in a helicopter and, and mm-hmm. how you can delegate work. And this speaks to leadership too, like we talked about, yeah. right? You know, if you, you take advantage of all the resources you have and not just a co-pilot, you have a helicopter, but you have an air crewman in the back. So you're a team of three and, and one plus one plus one is certainly generally greater than one if you do this right. Right. <laughs> and so, um, I had to learn very quickly to do everything myself initially and uh, when I was flying single seat, which is why at the end of my career when I could fly with a, a Wizzo, I really came to like that because yeah. I felt just that much better. Um, so part of it then became how do you manage your time? Like you're not only flying, but you're trying to flip through approach plates and change frequencies. And um, I figured it out. And, and the good news is the F-18 has got a great, you know, uh, flight control system. So it flies real smoothly. And, and, and so I felt like... Once I kind of figured that out, I was able to you know manage my time and worry now worry about things like the tactical stuff, right? And and adversaries in the air or stuff on the ground. And you know that's flying an F eighteen. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's it flies pretty smoothly, right? Um, Sean's first flight, he flew pretty well. Now it's all the tactical stuff that comes after. Yeah. Whereas a helicopter flying, I mean, it's it, I'm gonna say it's hard, but it's more time consuming, and you have spend a lot more effort when you're actually at the controls. Um, and once you've done it for a while, it becomes second nature. Um, so you have to really rely to be, I think, to be effective to have a good 
you know, crew dynamic there with your co-pilot and your crewman. So anyways, I, I don't know if it's retraining. I just became to learn how to prioritize more quickly and, and then value then who are, who do you have at your resource? And it's no longer your co-pilot, it's your wingman or it's the LSO That's or right. it's the ship. And, and you've always got somebody else out there. And so as you got better in your own cockpit, then you can start reaching out, which is why our syllabus is based on that, you know, to eventually you're commanding entire strikes, right? And you've right. got thousands of airplanes that you're at your control as it were. But that, that was probably the, what I remember the biggest challenges. Okay. How do you do it well yourself by yourself? And then now how do you start paying attention to all the other stuff that's important? And that was a challenge. But, it's but a fun. lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Well, I do remember flying together and, and we had some good discussions and uh, some interesting experiences. I mean, on yeah. our very first flight, remember we had to do that low flyby and they yeah. like, Oh, there's some truck in the field. Go bomb it. Like, well, is it, you know, what's the yeah. story here? So we didn't end up bombing anything. And then one night, I guess, didn't we see a surf yeah. to air missile? I think you shot at, didn't we? Well, it went up <laughs> where we could see it is the way I put it. But you brought this up at my retirement. I, did, I yeah. guess you called it and I was already looking at it. I just said, well, I forget what I, I cool. Said, I think you said cool. Uh, remember, I remember where we were though, right in our training. And here you are, Top Gun trained, and at the you know as, as sharp as you can be, and the tip of the spear. And I'm still a I'm a very senior nugget, as it were, my nugget cruise, actually. right? Yeah, and uh, hyper alert. Um, and number C in the uh, well, SA two, SA three. Who, who knows what it was? Uh, yeah, and it and it comes up and. And I remember as soon as I see it, I second guess what I was seeing. And then I was watching your jet. I'm like, certainly Joe would see this and do something. And, <laughs> and, and it clearly wasn't a threat. I didn't necessarily know that or I wasn't confident enough to know that right yeah. away. And I remember, I remember when I finally talked your eyes onto it, that was your first response. You said, cool. Which is pretty much how you've lived your entire life, Jill. All right. Well, thank you. I tried. I tried. <laughs> So you retired a year ago, you told us, and now you're, as I said, at the very, very top, a long time ago, it seems like now, yeah. uh, that you're still serving. I mean, you're advocating for veterans now. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I work now at uh, Veterans Village of San Diego, and we're a, a pretty large nonprofit here in San Diego that focuses on at-risk veterans and families. So, um, you know, we help we help veterans suffer from substance abuse or mental health or employment stuff. and really focus on like homeless veterans in the area in San mm-hmm. Diego and the county and try to get them in and, and either get them the treatment they need and also provide a stable housing environment for them. So we operate a main campus there uh, by the airport. It's, uh, you know, we have clinical beds for up to 320 essentially in that whole area to help bring folks off the street, let them go, you know, try to help these, help them with these problems. Um, we have great, we got a great chow hall. We got a great chef and we teach, you know, we have classes and, mm-hmm. and we have employment classes. We help with the resume writing and then, and then you have clothes and stuff from donations. And then we, we help them get back on their feet and get, get housing. And we do that same thing. We have a couple hundred veteran families that, uh, either, you know, are at risk for one reason or the other. We help them with payments for deposits or rent or utilities when they're struggling. Uh, we own a bunch of property around San Diego that we can put them in and, and kind of rent that to them. And then we operate three, uh, mental health clinics with the Cohen Veteran Network. Um, basically one in San Diego, one in Oceanside, and one in Los Angeles. And it's basically free mental health for veterans and their families. Um, so if they have TRICARE, we'll bill it. If they have, you know, insurance, we'll bill it. But otherwise, it's free and they mm-hmm. can get all the help they need. And there's a growing demand for that. So yeah, we like, you know, we help about 3,000 plus veterans a year and we do big events like a big stand down event, um, in the summer in the Pachanga Arena area. Mm-hmm. And so people can go to the website if they want to volunteer if they're in the area, but try to bring actual homeless veterans in the area and try to bring them there and get them the, the care they need, medical, dental. We have barbers there. If they have pets, we take their pets in and, and then get them fed. And, and then we try to bring them into our program and then get them kind of back on their feet. Yeah. So, yeah, we, they've done a lot, obviously, for the nation, and, and they deserve our help and support sure. as long as possible. absolutely. But I want to ask you, because I read this little short, I don't know if it was a poem or a story or whatever, but it, 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 the, the setting is there's this guy walking on the beach and there's all these stranded uh, starfish. Yeah. And there's just thousands and thousands. And he's throwing them in one at a time back in the ocean. And some passerby walks up and says, what are you doing? Can't you know? Don't you realize you can't possibly make a difference? And he's holding one and he throws it and he says, I made a difference to that one. Yeah. Do you feel like, I mean, obviously you're making an individual yeah. difference, but do you ever feel overwhelmed by it or are we, are we getting on top of this or is it out of our control? Yeah, I think, I think we're making, uh, I think we're making progress. The numbers show that yeah. the veteran population, the veteran homeless population in San Diego County is decreasing. Good. Um, it's not zero, which is the goal, right? Um, sure. you know, it's about seven to eight percent of the larger homeless population that we have or people experience homeless in San Diego County, which is about 8,000 or so. And we do, we go out and do a, 
what's called a point in time count. So, you know, I was part of a team in February. We got four in the morning. You just start counting homeless, talking to them and getting information from them. Uh-huh. And so we have decent data, right? It's always hard to count because it's kind of a migratory uh, group at times. But, yeah, it's a great story. I think even Mother Teresa had something similar, right? It's like you can't save everybody so safely you can. Mm-hmm. Um, the homeless problem is challenging, right? It's based on employment statistics and housing availability and cost of living and drug epidemic problems from the border. I mean, there's so many facets. And there's if anyone has one solution to solve it all, then then I'm all ears. And, and there's people that are much smarter than me. I'm still – now I'm a nugget in this business of helping out veteran homeless. There's people who have been doing this for, the, you know, for 30, 40 years. Wow. Uh, and so I still have a lot to learn. But – but there is no one solution. So yeah, I, I guess I think we're making a difference. I see it every day. I get to talk to veterans that are in our in our program. I get to watch them make progress. I get to watch them talk to a guy today that while he was there for six months is now clean and sober. Now he's moving to an apartment this weekend. He's going to get a c- cooking job. He's got a culinary class lined right. up. And here's somebody that's you know that just was down on their luck. And mm. you know I think it's important to look at folks that are experiencing homelessness as people. Like it's easy. Because it's so complicated, it's easy to kind of either totally discount it or, you know, hold them accountable. And you just need to remember they're all people. They have families. And, and with veterans specifically, in many cases, they just – they stumbled and fell in a hole, as it were. Yeah. And they need help getting out. And and I and I think veterans – to me, I, you can see that progress because veterans have that ingrained in them, that DNA of wanting, you know, something to serve as something bigger than themselves. So they tend to do really well in the program when they get together. And, and, uh, and I, I get to see it every day. And that's – it's you know that's the enjoyment of it I think and and I think that's for anyone you know considering employment outside the military there's a lot of similarities you don't go nonprofit realm of things to get rich right you do it for a, a sense of service and a sense of helping people out and and you're going to be surrounded by people that are doing the same thing that need that some cases that military background your ability to manage operations um, so I feel very lucky I got you know like I was put in the job as a veteran that I am and I'm the chief operating officer there so I've got overview of all the operations and, and again learning a lot but I, yeah I find it pretty rewarding and, and long days and um, but I so far I, I guess I'm content with my decision to go down this path yeah well you're making a difference in the lives of people which is what you did uh, as a hel- helicopter pilot as a young yeah. man and as yeah. a squadron commander and as a air uh, aircraft carrier commander so yeah thanks well good on you well in addition to that uh, you kept a low profile for a couple of years uh, when you first came back yeah. I remember we talked a little bit about uh, you know what's the plan and you've you were definitely bombarded as I understand from news that yeah. would love to get the exclusive on you so by the way thank you for coming on the fighter pilot podcast uh but now are, are you ready to you're going to be on some shows and you're working on a writing project yeah yeah so i you know that's an exciting thing for this for me and i you know I, when i retired in the midway I, I used to tell people it wasn't retirement it was a graduation like you know in, in no way did i feel like i was ready to retire put my feet up and, and so i like to look at my retirement as a graduation which is a much better way to think about it right, okay. for me personally mm-hmm. um but with that become lessons you've learned right and and i had a obviously a long career and i was blessed to have some great commands and learn a lot and a lot of tremendous opportunity um i learned some stuff through the tr i think so I, what i, I kind of wanted to capture that and 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 people always say you know written out is thought out so for me the way to do that was to to you know to basically write it out and kind of write you know basically take an extended retirement slash graduation speech and write it out in a way that i found that would be impactful um, yeah, so I, anyways, I worked with a team and I, I have a book that now comes out June 13th. It's called Surf When You Can. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, in an essence, it's a, it's a leadership philosophy life book full of sea stories. Um, it's not, you know, if you're looking for the hard edge type of military memoir, that's not what it is. This is probably more like Ted Lasso and, and I think stories that are relatable to a much broader audience. You know, I, and my goal was I'd write a book that people would, want to buy of course because there's business to this but i mean i want them to because i think it's there's things i wanted to say and i want it to be as enjoyable by my eight or nine year old niece and nephew as it is by somebody that i was lucky enough to fly with in combat in iraq and and so that's a wide swath i realize that but i think ideally that's kind of how i kind of wrote it in a way that everything there's something for everybody in there yeah. so that comes out and i'll do yeah there'll be some media stuff as we approach that and um you can buy it on um you can buy it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble now and pre order sure. it. And I, I recorded the book um, recently, so there'll be an audio book if, if you're like me and don't always have time to read. But but then you have to listen to my voice for <laughs> seven hours, so it's up to you. <laughs> I think we just did for about two. I haven't checked my watch in a little bit. But, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so that's have, good. Yeah, maybe you're done after we'll that. Be, uh, we'll be happy to link to it, and yeah, uh, I you. certainly look forward to reading it. And Thanks, uh, John. I think people will be interested because you are sort of an iconic hero in a sense, right? I mean, you, you stood for something larger, as we've talked about on this show now. Yeah. And 
while you were in a sense punished for it, it wasn't like a lot of commanders are punished yeah. for poor decisions right. or fraternization or whatever. It was for doing the right thing, arguably. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, for me, the Navy is a family business and I, and I, I felt like, yes, I had disagreements, uh, at the end and, and how I wanted to handle things. And that's just part of the business. Right. Yeah. And I felt like I had tremendous support, um, throughout the, the entire thing. Um, and to include after up until the end. And I, you know, and this is one thing to say about the book. I hope someone reads it and wants to join the Navy, like wants to, reads it and goes, you know what? The Navy has some cool things, not just the technical aspect of stuff. Cause I don't talk a lot about that, but there's the cultural piece and they yeah. see that, you know, it's not all about, you know, it's, there's a, so, not softer side, but there's a side that's about relationships and the connections and the culture that's, that I found, uh, inspiring to be part of for 30 years. And I'm hoping to, you know, that's what, with the nonprofit realm is very similar. So yeah. um, I, that's kind of where I hope the book goes. And, and, uh, yeah. And those are experiences as you and I can both attest and you do in your book. It sounds like that you won't get anywhere else. I mean, you can, yeah. you can have meaningful careers elsewhere, but nothing like serving and especially in the Navy, as yeah. we know. Yeah. Of course we didn't serve in the Air Force, so we would have had different experiences. But we can but, guess. We can guess pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just have one last question, but I realized actually maybe we should add a new question as sometimes I ask my guests to bring uh, some props and you've got two helmets. There's one behind you on the wall over there. Hopefully they can see, but uh, tell us about your two helmets. Is this one's got uh, the big stick on there? So was this the one you were wearing at the end? Yeah. So this is you know they were nice enough to take my old helmet from BFA ninety four and then kind of retape it and yeah. So that's it's the TR stuff. I think the the PRs the pair you know parachute riggers on the and uh, BFA one twenty two put that together and um yeah it was kind of cool. There's some good pictures you know with that with that on. Yeah, obviously when you're flying you can't see that so it's kind of more cool when you're done yeah. or people take pictures with it but uh, yeah they did a nice job so yeah and then, and then there's a helicopter and that's you know that's certainly not my my first helicopter helmet my first one had the the slide so if you think about with the a little older, neural knot thing yeah and wow. you generally you know lose that somewhere in the cockpit yeah um, so I think this is what we went to later on and then I flew with uh, HC8 which is the squadron on board the Theodore Roosevelt um, and they were kind of like my adopted squadron or they adopted me as it were mm-hmm. I got to fly with them and a great squadron and uh, took me back to my roots um, yeah as a helicopter you, you couldn't just wear your jet helmet in the uh, little no they're a little different, no, they're a little different. Yeah, yeah a little different and, okay. and then I didn't that was actually the one I left my first, you know from HSL 37 with so it's still the same helmet and All right. they just cleaned it up for me and, yeah all right, and finally, tradition here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Brett Crozier, Chopper. I think we can figure that out. Yeah. Here's my big question. What were you before you became Chopper? Because they wouldn't have called you Chopper right. in your first tour. Right. Um, yeah, so we didn't have call signs. Really? I mean, yeah, I mean, now it's right. more common because yeah. helicopters generally deploy in air wings and air wings as part yeah. of the culture. Um, and you don't need them, right? If you go back to the lineage of why we have call signs and why we use those on open radio circuits back in World War II and stuff for, for security reasons. So a helicopter, I mean, I, when I was a helicopter pilot initially, we didn't need them because you could just talk to the the guy or gal next to you or the your crewman in the back and call them Brett, Tom, you know, <laughs> Eller, <laughs> you know, whatever you want. Um, so it wasn't until then I got to my first squadron, VFA 97, because mm-hmm. uh, I had gone through various call signs for the training command at that point. And again, all they were all flabbergasted that I, I didn't come with a call sign. And probably Jack Byer, um, who basically said, I never want you to forget where you came from. We're going to call you Chopper. I was going to ask you if it was Odie or one of those guys. Yeah, I, so think, Jack, I mean, I huh? think I think Jack is the one, and then they all jumped in on that. And <laughs> it's so logical. It is, and there's and there's obviously more than one Chopper out there, but um, but we, we'll fight over who gets to keep. Yeah, it. The Chopper Rovenolt at least. Yeah, uh, Chopper, he was a helicopter pilot. Was so, he too? Yeah. Okay. Similar like transition. Uh, Army. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he's again. Wow. So. So maybe we're not that creative in naval issue too, but uh, <laughs> but we can't ever be seen the same place. So that's as part of that. Well. I was fearing the end of this. That's why I keep asking questions, but I guess we got to cut it off at some point. But, yeah. uh, Chopper, I mean, I don't even know how to summarize. Uh, you've been a great friend for over 20 years and I've learned a lot from you. And I, I, and that's why, again, at the beginning, I was like, Oh, for a little while, I got to tell you, teach you something. Yeah. And, uh, that, you know, that, those tables flipped very quickly. Yeah. Uh, no, but it's, uh, I, you know, I, I knew when I retired, I didn't necessarily have a lot of the same opportunities. So I didn't need a big pomp and circumstance. I just wanted one person who made yeah. a difference, uh, with me up there. And, and that was you. So thank Thanks, you for that. Yeah. 
that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, if you don't mind me saying so, on behalf of the listeners and the viewers and the, yeah. and the citizens of this country who didn't get a chance, really, to thank you for what happened and what you did and, and the sailors and all that. So yeah. I just I want to take that opportunity, that liberty to do that. Yeah. And more importantly, thank you for spending the last however many hours it's been <laughs> explaining it here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. You, yeah, no, you've been a good sport. And I'm player. sure Mary's going to get mad at both of us for taking longer than we expected. But no, this I've, was really great. And I've, I've been looking forward to this a long time. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. You've been a great friend throughout the whole thing. From the moment I got back from the TR, we got to talk. But, you know, it obviously goes all the way back to flying together when you were instructor and then my first combat flight in F-18. And, and uh, yeah, you've been a great friend and great wingman. Thanks for, you know, all your support. Your whole family has been very supportive of all of us. So thank you. And thanks for the opportunity today. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the discussion. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. I still do every episode. Now, as a quick reminder, we try to explain all the jargon, but in case you missed something, head on over to fighterpilotpodcast.com where we have a glossary of all the different terms we use. And while you're there, check out some of the cool merchandise that we offer. For additional content and to help support the show, please go check out our Patreon page. We'll see you next week.